Alright guys, in this video we will see what is a server and what is a client and then in this video we will also see what a proxy server is. So let's first see what is a server. Now a server in most cases is a very powerful computer that provides services to other computers on a network. Like for example, a computer may request for some kind of file or web page from the server. Now the server will contain information about what the other computers are looking for. So it will process that request and will provide that requested service to the computer. So we can say that the server is the holder of the content. Its job is to provide that content to all the requested computers. So let's say we have a server. One of the computer requested something from the server. Now the server will look for what is requested by the computer. So it will process that request and will respond back to the computer by providing what the requested computer is looking for. Well, it may be possible that the server cannot provide what is requested. So the server will respond back that I cannot provide what you are looking for. Like for example, file cannot be found on the, on the server error or the web page you are looking for cannot be found on the server. Alright, so now let's assume that the server 1 cannot provide the service what the requested computer is looking for. But this time, instead of throwing an error message to the requested computer that what you are looking for cannot be found, it will send that request to server 2. Now the server 2 will look if it can provide that service that the server 1 has basically requested and let's say that it also cannot provide that service and let's say it send that request to server 3. Now the server 3 will look if it can provide that service and let's say that the server 3 says that alright I know what you are looking for and I can provide that service. So server 3 will respond back to server 2 with that request. Server 2 will then send that a service to server 1 where it came from and then finally server 1 will provide that service to the requested computer. So that is actually the flow of request of how it travel and then how it get back to the requested computer. Now the server in most cases is connected with multiple computers like for example it may be connected with 5 computers, 100 computers, 1000 computers or maybe if it is a very powerful computer then it might be connected with millions of other computers as well. Alright, now let's see what is a client. Well, the computer that is requesting some service from the server through a network is known as client. So that requested computer is known as client. So the client requests something from the server and then the server sees if it can provide that request and then responds back to the client. Now, in most cases, the clients are normal computers or laptops or maybe tablets, phones, etc. that we are actually using almost every day. And it is relatively smaller, less powerful and also cheaper than the server. Now, servers are very powerful computer. They are designed to process lots and lots of requests. And the size of the server depends upon the traffic that is the amount of clients and requests it is required to process. Also the size depends upon the computing power as well. If it is a very powerful computer then its size will also be very big. Now it may be possible that the server can get lots and lots of requests which may slow down the whole network. So this is where proxy server comes in. The proxy server will act as a gateway between the client and the server. The request before going to the main server, it first goes to the uh, proxy server and if the proxy server can provide that service, it will provide that service instead of going to the main server. So let's say we have a client and then we have a proxy server in between the client and the main server and let's assume that our main server is this time the Google server. So let's say that the client requests something from the Google server but the request instead of going to the Google server directly, it first goes to the proxy server. The proxy server request uh, processes that request and provide that service 
to the client if it can provide. Well, let's say that the proxy server cannot provide the service that the client is looking for. So it will send this request to the main server. So the main server will provide the service and response back to the proxy server. Now the proxy server will store that service in its cache because it is always maintaining its cache and will response back to the client. Next time when the client requests the same service, this time it will go to the proxy server and the proxy server this time will provide that service to the client instead of going to the main server. So as I told you that the server might be connected with thousands or in some cases with millions of other computers if the server is a very powerful computer. But there is a limit of requests that the server can handle and after reaching its limit it cannot further process requests which will ultimately slow down the network. So that is the point where proxy server will comes in handy. It will try to resolve client request instead of sending it to the main server because it knows that the main server is a very busy server. The request may take a long time for processing. So it will first look for that request in its cache. If it is found there, it will provide that requested service to the client from there. So yeah, in this video, we learned about server client. And then we also learned about a very important concept known as proxy server. So yeah, that's it for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me through email and I will get back to you as soon as I can. So for this video, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys next time. All right, guys, in this video, I'm going to be talking about two main types of protocols that are TCP and UDP. Both TCP and UDP are used for sending packets over the internet. Now packets, if you don't know, basically contain small parts of data. So for example, if you send an email to your friend, then that email contains some content or data. Now this data is divided into small packets so that it can be sent over the network. So TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, while UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. So let's first discuss the Transmission Control Protocol, that is the TCP. Now in the previous video, we have seen that the client sent requests for some services from the server and the server responds back by providing that requested service. But let's say the server give response to the uh, client, but the response gets lost during its way and thus cannot reach the client. Or the client can request something from the server, but the request gets lost during its way before it can reach to the server. Now, what should we do? How to tackle such a big problem? That was the biggest problem when the internet was first launched that most of the communication between the server and the client gets lost during the way and that was the biggest challenge at that time to resolve this issue. Now, how to handle these lost request? So this is where they started using the TCP, the transmission control protocol, the transmission control protocol, which establishes a reliable connection between the client and the server. Now we're going to see what TCP is and how it basically establish a reliable connection between the server and the client. So by establishing a TCP connection between the client and the server, it is guaranteed that the data will be delivered both uh, to the client and the server. The next very important thing that TCP guarantees is that all the packets will be delivered in the same sequence in which they were sent. So TCP makes sure that all the data are received in the same sequence in which, it, in which it is sent and that no packet is lost. So we can say that the TCP is connection oriented. So let's consider that your friend writes a very important email to you. Now you don't want any sentences or we can say packets missing in that email. Also, you want all the sentences and words to be received in the same sequence in which they are written. And now the advantage of TCP is that it guarantees you both of these things. So if you have a TCP connection established, none of these sentences or words will be missing in the email 
and all the sentences and words will be received in the exact same order in which they are written. All right, now let's understand the working of TCP. So let's say we have a client and a server. Now the client will send the first packet with a sequence number of one and let's say that this packet contain eight bytes of data. Now, once the client sends a packet to the server, it is then programmed to wait for a specified amount of time. Let's say it is five seconds so that the server can respond back in that time. So let's say that the server responds back with an acknowledgement signal of 100 in that specified time or before timeout. Now that acknowledgement signal, the server is telling the client that I have received the packet and the channel is free. You can now send a new packet. Now the client will send the new packet only when it has received an acknowledgement signal from the server before timeout. So in our case, the client will send a new packet this time with a sequence number of one now this sequence number is important as we want all the data to be received in the same order in which it is sent. Now the server will then send a new acknowledgement signal of this time let's say 101 but this time let's say that the acknowledgement signal get lost during the way before it can reach to the client. The client on the other hand is waiting for a specified period of time after that time is expired it will send again the same packet of sequence number of two whose acknowledgement signal is not received. So in our case, the acknowledgement signal of sequence number of two was not received. So again, it sent the same packet of sequence number of two and now the server will send again the same acknowledgement number that is 101 to the client. And now let's say that this time the client received the acknowledgement signal within a specified period of time. So in this way, TCP makes sure that all the packets are sent and received and that no packet is lost. This way, our data is received in the same order in which it is sent. Now the problem of TCP is that it is slow because the client always have to wait for the acknowledgement signal so that it can further send some data. But it is a very secure network because it gives you the guarantee that all the packets will be received in the same order in which they were sent. And that is why it is using the sequence number as well so that it can receive the data sequentially. Now it is used for requesting web pages, receiving and sending emails, etc. Now what do you think are some other uses of TCP? All right, now if you want faster communication between client and server and where security is not that much important and you can compromise on security, then you should use the user datagram protocol UDP instead of TCP. Now in UDP, it is not guaranteed that the data will be delivered to the destination and that is why it is faster as in UDP, as UDP does not wait for the acknowledgement signal, it keeps on sending data without waiting, without waiting for the acknowledgement signal. And now here is one very important note and that is the UDP itself does not manage the sequence of packets. And if you want your data to be managed in sequence in sequence, then it has to be managed by the application layer. Well, if you don't know application layer, application layer in short is the interface that is responsible for displaying the received information to the user. So we can now say that UDP is unreliable and not secure as it is not guaranteed that the packets would reach its destination, but just because of its speed, it has tons and tons of uses. Like for example, it is used in video conferencing in which our actions are received to another individual very fast because it is using UDP instead of TCP. Another very important use of UDP is live streaming. So for example, you are watching your favorite show on television and you caught some connection problem during your favorite show. And after some time you fix your problem, but you will then not be able to see that part uh, that happened during the connection problem because it is using UDP. And finally, it is also used in online games where the speed is very important than the security. 
So in this video, we cover two very important types of protocols that is TCP and UDP. So I hope that you understood it. If not, then feel free to contact me through email and I will get back to you as soon as I can. So up till next video, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys next time. Hey guys, in this video, we will start the coding part of this section and in this first video of coding, we're gonna create a server. So what this server is going to do is that it will be able to accept client request and then should be able to respond back to the client with the service it has requested for. Now since we do not have some other server, so we will set our own computer to act as a server and then the same computer will act as a client as well. Now in order for the server to accept client request, that server must be running. So this is what we're gonna be doing in this video. We will first create a server and then we will run it and make it ready to accept one or multiple requests from the client. So you know that we will use socket, so let's first import it. So right here at the top, we will import it, so import socket. All right, so now as I told you that our own machine will act as a server, so we will say host equal to localhost which is actually referring to our own computer. So that is our local host. And then let's say that the port number will be equal to 8080. And now we will create a socket that we have imported right here at the top. So let's create it right here. So we'll type socket dot and then the socket function. And now we need to pass here some parameter. So the first parameter will be socket dot AF I N E T and this basically means that we are using internet version 4 and now the next argument it takes is what kind of connection do we want to establish we want to establish a TCP connection or a UDP connection well let's say that we want to establish a TCP connection so if you want to establish a TCP, a TCP connection just type socket dot sock stream and this will create a TCP connection between client and server. And if you want to create a UDP connection, then you need to type here socket.sock dgram. And this will create a UDP connection between the client and the server. But since we will create a TCP connection, which is a very reliable connection, and we do not want packet to be lost during the way, so we will establish a TCP connection. So it is socket.sock stream and make sure that this thing is capitalized and then this thing is capitalized as well all right so now we have a socket and now let's store it in a variable and let's call this variable as sock all right so now we have a variable sock in which uh, that socket is stored and now we will bind this socket with this host number and port number so we will call this variable sock in which that socket is stored so sock dot and then the bind method and now we will bind this socket with this host number and port number now this bind method takes one argument so we will pass both the host number and port number as a tuple so it is host and then port and now we will make this socket ready to listen for client request so we will type here sock dot listen and let's say that this socket will be able to listen only one request at one time so let's say if you want to if you want this socket to listen for multiple requ multiple requests like 100 requests at one time then you need to type here one but for this video we will only listen to one request at one time so we will type here one so now this listen method is continuously listening for client request and when it listen for some kind of request from the client then it should be able to accept that request as well so we will type here sock dot accept now this accept method returns two things the first one is the connection that is established between the client and the server and the second one is the address from where it get connected so we will store these two things into variables so let's call it as connection and address so the connection will be stored in this variable con and then the address from where it get connected will be stored in this variable address all right so now we have 
a socket which is bind to this host number and port number and then it is continuously listening for client request and then when it listen to some kind of request from the client it will be able to accept that client request as well. Now this socket will be able to provide the service which the client has requested and let's say that this server is designed to give some important messages to the client. Well the server can give anything to the client which, which it has requested but let's say for simplicity this server will only send an important message. So first of all we will create that message. So let's create a variable and let's store that message in it and let the message be hey there is something important for you. Alright so now we will send that message to the client which has requested it. So we have the connection so we will send that message to that connection which which is established between the client and the server. So I will say connection dot send and we will send basically it is not send file it is only send we will send this message to the client which has requested it. So we will pass here this message variable and now this message variable is in string and on a network we cannot send a string. We need to encode this message into binary form so that it can be sent over the network. So we will type here message dot encode and now this encode function will convert this message into binary form. And now when this message is sent to the client then we will close the connection. So we will type connection dot close. Alright so we now have a socket which is listening to client requests and then we are providing basically some important message to that client which is in encoded form obviously so that it can travel over the network. So now let's say that we will print out a message here uh, when the client or when the server is listening for a request. So we will type print the server is running and is listening to clients requests. Alright so now we can run uh, this whole file so just run it. Alright so now we have a server which is continuously listening for client request. So now in the next video we will create a client which will be able to send a request to the server and then the server will listen to the request right here and then will accept that connection and then will send this message to the client in the encoded form. So we will create client in the next video. In this video we created a server which is now running and is continuously listening to client request because the server is continuously listening for client request and now make sure that whenever the client request something from the server that server must be must be in a running mode so that it can accept client request. So in the next video we will create a client. So for this video thank you so much for watching and if you have any questions feel free to contact me through email and I will get back to you as soon as I can. So up to the next video thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys next time. Hey guys, in this video we're gonna start working on the client side. In the previous video we have developed a server and it is running and it's ready to accept client requests. Actually our own computer is acting as a server and now our own computer will act as a client as well. So basically what this client is going to do is that it will send a request to the server, the server will then respond back with an important message and then the client will receive this message and we will print out this message sent by the server. So now let's start working on the client side. So I have made a new file and I named that file as client.py. So you, you also made a new file and then named it anything you want. And now the first thing uh, on this client side we need to do is that we need to import socket because we need a socket on the client side as well. So we're going to import first of all socket and then our host will be equal to obviously localhost and then the port number will be 8080. And now we will create a socket. So socket which is the name of the module that we have imported. So socket.socket .socket. and now the first parameter it takes is socket.af 
I and E team. And this basically means that we are using internet version 4. And then the second parameter is what kind of connection do we want to establish? Well, we want to establish a TCP connection. So we will type here socket dot sock stream. And if we have to establish the UDP connection, then we need to type here sock underscore dgram. So, but since we are establishing a TCP connection, so we need to type here sock underscore stream. All right, so now we have a socket and now we will store that socket in some variable. So let's call this variable as sock and put it equal to this thing. All right, so now we have a socket and now we will connect the client with the server. So I will type sock, which is the name of the variable in which we have stored socket. So sock dot connect. And now since our server is on localhost and port number 8080. So we will pass these two variables host and port number. So this connect method only takes one argument. So we need to pass both this host and port number in a tuple. So we need one more bracket and then in this tuple we will type uh, host and then port. Alright, so now we are connected uh, with our server and now when the client will send a request to the server, then the server will respond back with this message. And now this client will be able to receive this message. So let's create a variable in which that, in which that client will receive that message. So message equal to sock dot receive. Now the maximum size of the message, uh, the sock will receive is let's say one zero two four bytes. Well, we can put any size value, but 1024 bytes is enough to store a message. Now, since we have a connection with a server, the server will keep on sending packets and the client will keep on receiving these packets. So we need a loop here so that we keep on receiving packets from the server until all the packets are received on the client side. So I will say while you are receiving the message, keep printing out this message. So print, I will type message and then message. And now since this server has sent that message in the encoded form, now we need to decode this message on the client side so that we can see the message in its original form. Because the client has sent the message in binary form that is in the encoded form and now on the client side, we need to decode the, uh, decode this message once it is received. So we will decode it using the decode method. All right. So now this decode um, now this decode function will basically decode the message in its original form, and then we will keep on uh, storing all the packets in this variable message that we have created right here at the top. And now we will create it again here. So message equal to sock dot receive, and let's say that the maximum size uh, of this of the message that this variable can store is 1024 bytes. All right, so now when the complete packets of the message are received, we will now close the connection. So we will get out of the loop and we'll close the connection. So we will type, basically we will close the socket. So sock dot close. All right, so the first thing we, we did is that we imported socket and then we created that socket and stored and stored that socket in a sock variable. And then we connected the socket with the, with the server and the server is running on the local host and port 8080. So now the client will go to the local host and then port 8080. And then when it will get connected with the server, the server will send a message and then that message will be received on the client side in this variable message. And then we are saying, as long as we are receiving the packets of the message, just keep on receiving it and then keep on decoding it as well. And then when all the message is received, then close the socket as well. All right, so now it is ready, but I'm getting an error here. It is invalid syntax. Oh, I think that we need this colon here and then right here as well. So yeah, this time the error should be gone and it is now gone. 
All right, so before running the client side, we need to make sure that the server is running. Well, it is not running. So first of all, we need to run the server. So just execute first of all server.py. So execute it. All right, so now the server is running and it's listening to client request. And now we will send a request to the uh, server by running this client. So when we run the client side, it will get connected with the server here and then it will receive that message in this variable message. And then when all the message is received, the socket will be closed. All right, so now let's execute uh, this client.py on a new console screen. So just run client.py. All right, so the client has received this message from the server and basically the message sent by the server is basically the same that we can see on the console screen. So the server basically sent that message and now you can see that the server has established a connection with the local host and when it sent a message successfully in the encoded form, it then closes the connection as well. So you can see that the, the server is not running because we specified here that when you send the message, then close the connection as well. So this is what it did. It sent a message to the client. When the client received a message, it then closes the connection as well. All right, and now on the client side, when the server send a message, it is received in this variable message, and then it keeps on receiving all the packets of the message and until the server is sending the message. And then when the whole message is received, it then closes this socket as well so you can see that after receiving the whole message this console screen is now not in the running mode as well so now we have created both the client and the server well if you are getting any type of error make sure that your server is running before you run the client side and even then if you are getting some kind of error then feel free to contact me through email and i will definitely get back to you as soon as i can well yeah that's it for this video and up to the next video thank you for watching and i will see you guys next time all right guys in this video we will develop a server which will be able to send a file to the requested client so basically the client will send a request to the server asking for some file the server will look for that requested file if it is found, it will send that file to the, uh, to the requested client or else if it is not found, it will send an error message that the requested file cannot be found. All right, so again, I'm on the server side as you can see here. And now on the server side, we do not need these two lines of code because we are not going to send a message to the client. We are now going to send a file to the client. So first of all, I'm going to create a variable and I'm going to call this variable as file name because this variable is going to contain the name of the file that the client has requested for. So I will type connection and connection is basically this variable to which we have established a connection. So I will type connection dot receive the name of that file and the name of that file will be no bigger than 1024 bytes. All right, so now we have the name of the file that the client has requested for, and now the server will try to open that file. So I'm going to create a variable and we'll name it as file and we'll put it equal to open. And now what file the server wants to open? Well, it wants to open the file that client has requested for, and we store the name of that file in this variable file name. All right, so we will type here file name. And now basically since we want to read that file so in this second parameter we will type read bytes all right and now once the file is open we will read all the content of this file so for this i'm going to create another variable and i'm going to call it as read file and we'll put it equal to file which is basically this variable so file dot read and now this read function will read all the content which is inside this file and now we will send all this content which is stored in this variable read file to the client which has requested for so i will type connection to which we have established a connection so connection dot send 
and we will send all the contents stored in this file so i will type read file which is the name of this variable in which we have stored all the contents of the file and once we send that file we will close this file as well so file dot close all right so now we are pretty much done but it is also possible that the client request for some file and that file might not be found on the server so we will put these lines of code in try and accept block so we will type try and then we will put these lines of code in the try block all right so first of all it will try to open that file and if the file is not found on the server then it will go to the accept block and in the accept block we will send an error message to the client to which we have established a connection so connection dot send and now we will send the message the error message and let's say that the error message is file not found on the server and then obviously we need to encode this message so that it can travel on a network so dot encode and yeah that's it so first of all we will receive the name of the file that the client has requested for and then the server will try to open that file and will read all the content in that file once it is opened and then after all the contents are open it will send all the contents to the client to which we have established a connection with and once we have sent all the contents of the file we will close that file as well and if that file is not found on the server it will then come to this accept block and will send this message this error message in the encoded form to the client so yeah now we can run this server site so let's execute server.py so just simply run it all right so now you can see that we have no error and the server is now running and it's listening to client request so now in the next video we will create the file client and the file client will basically request for some kind of file from the server and then the server will look for that file and when it will send that file to the client the client will receive that file and then will display it on the console screen as well so yeah we have only developed a file server in this video and if you have any questions related to to this video or any other video of this course feel free to contact me through email and i will definitely get back to you as soon as i can so up till next video thank you so much for watching and i will see you guys next time all right guys in this video we will set up file client which will be able to send the name of the file it needs and then when the server sends that file it should be able to receive that file as well so first of all we need to create a file that the server will send because our server is empty it has no content so let's first create a file so let's click file and then new file and let's name that file as abc.txt all right so now we have a txt file and now let's uh, put some content inside that file like this is and important file content all right so now we have this content inside that file and now we will move on to the client side and now i'm going to create a variable but first of all we need to get rid of these lines of code because we will not be receiving a message this time so just get rid of this line of code as well and now i'm going to create a variable and i'm going to name that variable as file name which will store the name of this file abc.txt and then that client will send that file to the server and then the server will look for that file so that file name is abc.txt and now we will send that file to the server we will basically request that file uh, from the server so we will send it uh, through socket so sock.send and then the name of that file which is stored in a variable file name so file name 
and then obviously we need to encode this uh, file name because it is in string so we need to encode it so that it can travel over the network so file name dot encode all right so now this socket method will send the name of that file on uh, to the server and now on the server side it will be received right here and then it will try to open that file and then it will try to read the content inside that file and then it will send that file as well so now when it will send that file it will come to this client side and now we will create a variable which will store all of this content which is sent by the server so i will type read file and then put it equal to socket dot receive and the size of the content sent by the server will be let's say 1024 at max 1024 bytes and then we will print all the contents on the console screen so i will type print read file dot decode because we need to decode all the contents so now uh, once we have decoded all the content and print it out on the console screen we will close the socket as well all right so now that's it we need to do on the client side and now before running this uh, client side we need to make sure that our server is running and it is not running so we need to first run our server so let's first run server.py all right so now the server is running and is listening to client request and now we will run the client side as well and we will run the client side on a new console screen uh, so let's just open it and let's run client.py so just simply run and you can see that on the client side we have this content printed out on the console screen and this content is basically in this file abc.txt so in this file we have stored this thing which is this is an important file content and now you can see that on the client side we have received this content right here on the console screen so now let me explain what basically is happening uh, one last time all right so first of all we created a server and then we bind it with the host and port number and it is now listening to client request all right and now once any kind of request came from the client side it will accept it and the connection which is established with the client will be stored in this variable connection and then the address will be stored in this variable address and then the client on the client side it will send it will basically request this file abc.txt so it will come to the server side the server will read the request from the server and it stored the name of that file in this variable file name and then it tried to open that file and read all the content in inside that file and then send all the content which is in that file to the client so when all the content is sent from the server to the client all the contents will be received here in this variable read file so this receive method would receive all the contents uh, in this variable read file and then we simply printed all the contents on the console screen all right so when all the contents uh, are sent the file is closed and the connection is closed as well on the server side and then once it printed out all the content in that file the connection on the client side is also closed so yeah we have now developed a file client and a file server the file client is sending some request that it needs that file the server then look for that file and if it is found it then send that file to the client all right now let's say that we request some other file which is not found on the server and let's uh, uh, name that file as something else like triple x which is not found uh, on this server and now again we will run first of all this server so let's first run this server so just simply run and execute all right and now and now the server is running and listening to client requests and now let's run the client side so just uh, run it on this console screen so just uh, run it all right so this time it is saying that file not found because basically it is printing out this message and it's sending and sending first of all it is sending this message to the client the client is receiving this message and printing out the message in the decoded form because we are requesting this file from the server and this file is not available on the server side 
So it sent this error message to the client in the encoded form and then the client printed out th that message in the decoded form. So yeah, that's it we need to do on the client and our server side. So in the next video, we will make a simple chat application using socket programming. So yeah, that's it for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me through email and I will get back to you as soon as I can. So up to the next video, thank you for watching and I will see you guys next time. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cab booking system in Python. So up till now you have seen the introduction video and you know what we are going to create. So right here we are going to start coding and the first thing which we are going to do is that we are going to import the required modules. Now the first module which we are going to need is going to be the Tikintra module which you know is going to act as the GUI for this application. So we are going to write in from Tikintra import steric and we are also going to write in from Tikintra we are going to import TTK. Now you might be thinking that what is the purpose of importing both of these. Now basically in order to work with uh, Tikinter applications and widgets we have to import the Tikinter library in the environment. Now there are basically two ways to import the Tikinter library in the notebook which are mentioned right in front of you. The first one is using from Tikinter import steric and the second one is that you have to import Tikinter as TTK. Now TTK here is kind of an object you can write in TK as well or you can write in anything which you want but TTK basically represents that we are working with Tikinter. It is something similar to or you can say an abbreviation of Tikinter so that's why we are using TTK here. Now the first method which says from Tikinter import a steric it is basically the Tikinter library which is most commonly in use as it comes with all the inbuilt methods or functions. Now in the general sense we don't have to explicitly override the methods for the widget. In this way we can create the objects of widgets just by using the widget constructor. Now it comes with all the modules defined in the Tikinter as well. However to save the major typing efforts we also import the Tikinter library with some acronym further that can be used to create an instance of widgets. Thus the application structures become more statical by using the import Tikinter as TTK. Now if you talk about the major difference between these two then the major difference between both the ways is that if you want to define the widget constructor explicitly by defining which module it is associated with then we can use the acronym method. However, if we want to define every widget by importing all the functions and module in it, then we can use that, we can use the from tikinter import steric method. So I hope that you have understood the difference between these two and why we have to use the statical way of uh, having this acronym TTK here. So let's get on. The next module which we are going to import is going to be the random module. Now the random module is a simple module that is going to help you to generate random numbers. The next module which we are going to import is going to be the time module. Now the time module is also a very simple module and as obvious from this module name it is going to help us deal with the time. The next thing which we are going to import is going to be from the Tikinter. We are going to import the message box and we are going to also import it with an acronym that is going to be MS which stands for message box. Now the Tikinter message box is basically a module in Python which provides a different set of dialogues that are used to display message boxes showing errors or warnings, widgets to select files or change color which is a kind of pop-up box with a relevant message being displayed along with the title based on the requirements in Python application with an icon and interrupts the user flow to take input from the user is called basically the Tikinter message box and it has different functions that are used to display the relevant messages based on the application requirements like information message, a warning message, an error message or maybe taking input from the user. So that's why we are also going to need this message box here and we have actually imported it with an acronym as well 
which means that we can use this acronym to actually execute anything which we want to execute using this message box. The last module which we are going to import here is going to be the SQL Lite 3. Now SQL Lite 3 is the database with which we are going to work now. We are going to need a database here because we have to actually store the username as well as the passwords of users and we have to actually create IDs for them and then they can actually log in using that IDs. So that's why we need a database to actually store information of users here. So this was all about the modules. We have imported the six modules which we are going to need. So the top two, as I told you, are going to be the same. Just a basic difference between these two, which we just discussed. Then we are going to need this random module, the time module, and from the tick enter module, we are also going to need the message box and we are going to be dealing with database. So that's why we are also going to need the SQL Lite 3. So I hope you have understood all the modules, their purpose. So that is it with this tutorial. In the next tutorial, we are going to start on with the coding part. We have already begun, but we are going to officially start on with the application code. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. So in the previous tutorial, we talked about the modules which we are going to require to actually code our application. In this tutorial, what we are going to do is that we are going to start on with the running part and that is going to be basically the part where the code is going to start executing. So we are going to write an if name and it is going to equal equal dunder dunder main. So this is basically where your code is going to start its execution. Now the first thing which you need to do in tkinter is that you have to write in root equal to tk which is basically going to be the starting point where your code is going to start its execution. Now you might have covered it in the tkinter part. If you haven't, then I recommend that you just go on and cover the basic course which we have uploaded at the very end, which is the prereq of this course to learn tkinter. So we have uploaded a crash course on tkinter. Just go and study if you don't know what I'm doing right here. So first you have to write in root equal to tk, which is actually going to create the root window for me. After that, what I will do is that I'm going to create two variables. The first one is going to be width, which I'm going to set to 1150. Then I'm going to specify a height, which is going to be 650, which is going to be actually the height of my root window. Right here, I'm going to write in the geometry. Now for the geometry, what I'm going to do is that I am going to have a specific pattern which I'm going to follow, which is going to be a value multiplied by a value which is going to get added to a value which is again going to get added to a value. And after that, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to write in percent and it is going to take in the width and the height, as well as we are going to specify the coordinates where it is going to pop up on the screen. So this is going to be the geometry. Now what we have to do is that using the root object with which we have actually created our main tkinter window, which is right over here. So using it, what we are going to do is that we are going to specify a geometry to our main root window which is going to be exactly according to this format, which we have mentioned right over here. So what it is going to be, that it is going to be a value multiplied by a value, then it is going to get added to a value, which is again going to get added to a value. So this is going to be the geometry which we are going to use. After that, we are also going to specify a title for our root window. So the first thing which is going to actually pop up when you actually execute your code is basically going to be the login form. So that's why the first thing which is going to pop up in our root window is going to be the login form. So that's why root.title is going to equal to 
the login form. And after that, what we are going to do is that we are going to create an instance for a class that is going to be named as user and we are going to pass upon root which is actually our main window to the constructor of that class so for now you have got this red line under here because we have actually not coded our main class here so finally the last thing which you need to do to close up this name equal to main is that you have to write in root.main loop and what that is going to do is that it is going to actually run your code so this is basically the starting of our code our code is going to start its execution right from here so the first thing which we are going to do is that we are actually going to create this user class and as you can see that we have also passed something to its constructor function so we are also going to receive that in the constructor function of this class but for this tutorial that is it in the next tutorial we are actually going to start on and we are going to actually code this class at the very start of the next tutorial so for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in python in this tutorial as i told you that we are going to be coding the user class constructor function so right at the top here what we are going to do is that we are going to write in class and we are going to name it as user which we have actually defined right over here as well so this is going to be the class where we are going to have a lot of functions we are going to have our login function inside this class we are also going to have our new user function inside this class through which you are actually going to enroll a new user we are also going to have our log and CR classes, which are the frame packing methods. We are going to have that in here as well. And we are also going to have our widgets function inside this class. But at the very start, the most important of all is the constructor function. So the first thing which we are going to do over here is that we are going to write an init function right over here. Now, as you know that you can see over here as well that we have actually passed in the root window to this constructor function. So right here, we are going to actually receive that as well. So we have received our main root window object right inside our constructor function. And inside the constructor function, what we are going to do is that the first thing we are going to do is that we are going to write in self dot master is going to equal to master now this has the very same explanation as with the this keyword as well so you have to write in self dot master equal to master and after that inside the constructor function you know that the constructor function is also known as the initialization function so right here what we are going to do is that we are going to create some useful variables so for as you know that the root window which we have actually received over here is basically the login form so for the login form what you need to do is that you have to create some variables the first one can be the username the second one can be the password now these two variables are for the instances when a user already exists in the database so what if the user does not exist in the database and actually you have to create a new user now for that what we are also going to do here is that we are also going to create a variable that is going to be named as the new username and also the new password so let's just get on with it so we are going to write in self dot username and we are going to specify a type to it so it is going to be a string variable which means that it is going to have strings variable pattern which it is going to follow after that we are also going to have self dot password and that is also going to be a string variable after that as i told you that for a new user what we are going to do is that we are going to have a n username which is for the new username and it is also going to be a string variable we are also going to have new password that is also going to be a string var now what we are also going to do is that we need to create actually the widgets for our login form now what are going to be those widgets now by widgets i mean the labels i can call it the entry fields where we are actually going to have uh input from the user like 
username or the password or the login button or the create account button. So we need to also create widgets. But we are not going to do that in the constructor function. Rather, in the constructor function, what we are going to do is that I'm going to write in self dot widgets. Now, what that is going to do is that it is actually calling upon a function named as widgets, which is also going to be a part of this class user, which we have defined. So from the constructor function, we just have four variables, which are the string var type. It is the username and the password for an already existing user and a new username and new password for a user which is not a part of a database and you have to actually get their data entered through the create account thing. So I hope that you have understood what we have covered in the constructor function here. In the next tutorial, what we are going to do is that before we get on and code the widgets function, what we are going to do is that we are going to talk some stuff about the database part. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we actually built our very first class user and inside that we also defined our very first function that was the constructor function in which we actually defined some very useful variables which are going to be in use a lot. So in this tutorial, what we are going to do is that before we get on with the widgets part, what we will do is that we are going to make a database and we are also going to make a table inside that database at the very start of, of our program. Now, there are two ways to do that. The first is to actually code it and create a database. Now there is also another way which is if you are using PyCharm, then what you can do is that if you look at the right side here, right more side here, you can see that the second option, the first one is notification and the second one is database here. So if you click on it, it is going to expand upon a window where you can see at the very top left corner, you have got this plus icon that is the new icon. So using that, you can actually create a new a data source. Now you can use any of the database which you want to use. Now, as you know that the module which we have actually imported is the SQL Lite 3. So what you what we are going to do here is that we are going to create an SQL Lite database. So you can just go on over here and you can actually create a database right over here. You can see that you have got your connectors here and you can just create a database, test the connection for that database and it is going to actually create a database for you right from here. Now, there is one more way, which as I told you, let me just minimize that, is that you can actually code it as well. So right here, what we will do is that we are going to code it, so just for learning purposes. So what we are going to do is that we are going to write in width, SQL like three dot connect. We are going to have a connection. And the first thing which we are going to have inside this connect here is that we are going to write in the name of the database which we are going to create. So we are going to create a database named as user and we are going to define an extension for it since it is a database. And also we are going to use an acronym over here which is going to be DB. So after that, what we are going to do is that we are going to write in C equal to DB dot cursor. Now, what is the purpose of a DB cursor here? Now, a DB cursor is kind of an abstraction that is meant for a data set traversal. In computer science and technology, a database cursor is kind of, you can say, a control structure that enables traversal over the records in a database. Now, cursor basically facilitates subsequent processing in conjunction with the traversal, such as a retrieval of data, addition of new data, and removal of existing data from the database records as well. Now, the database cursor characteristics of traversal makes the cursor akin to the programming language concept of iteration. And cursors can only can not only be used to fetch data from the database management system into an application, but also they can be used to identify a row in a table which you want to update or let's just say that you want to delete. Now the 2003 version of SQL standard defines positioned updates and positioned 
delete SQL statement for that purpose as well. Such statement now do not use a regular where clause with predict predicates. Now instead a cursor identifies the rows. The cursor must be open and already positioned on a row by means of fetch statement. Now, if you also go on and check the docs on the Python SQL Lite module, you can see that a Python module cursor is needed even for a create table statement. So basically it's used for cases where a mere connection object should suffice as correctly pointed out by the OP. Now such abstraction is different from what people understand as a DB cursor to be enhanced. The confusion on the part of users. Now, regardless of the efficiency, it is just a just a conceptual overhead. It would be nice if it was pointed out in the docs that the Python module cursor is a bit different than what a cursor is in SQL and databases. So that is actually the purpose of having this C equal to db dot cursor right over here. So it is basically used, as I told you, for kind of uh, the traversal purposes for doing a lot of things with the database. Now, the next thing which we are going to do is, this actually has actually created a database named as users.db in our database. Now, the next thing which we are going to do is that we are going to write in C dot execute. And what we are going to execute is basically going to be a query. Now, what is going to be that query is that we are actually going to create a table. Now, if you are creating your database right from here, then when you create a database, just right click on it and it is going to ask you to if you want to create a new table or not. And if you are doing it that way, not coding it over here, then you can go on and create a table from there as well. Just remember that you have to create a table according to the query, which I'm going to just write. And so you have to write in create table if not exists, which means that if it does not exist, then you have to create a table which is going to be named as user. This is not the name of the database. The name of the database is users, whereas the name of the table which we are going to create in this users.db is going to be user. Now inside this table, we are going to have specific characteristics. The first one is going to be the username for which it is going to be text it is going to be not null the next one is going to be the password which is also going to be text and which is also going to be not null which means that these are the necessary things which we are going to actually enter because if you do not write in that it is actually a actually if you do not write upon a username or a password then it is actually not going to create an id so that's why when we write in not null it is going to create entries which are going to be must to fill after that what you're going to write in you're going to write in db dot comet now what is basically comet mean now in a general sense a comet is the actually updating of a record in a database in the context of a database transaction a comet refers to the saving of data permanently after a set of tentative changes now a comet ends a transaction within a relational database and allows all other user to actually see the changes now when a database system actually confirms that the data has been saved. Now this must be an ironclad guarantee. If not, there is a risk of data integrity problems in which there is uncertainty as to whether the available data is actually correct or not. Now, while this sounds very simple, the reality is that database system must offer also a degree of fault tolerance. This means that the data must still be saved even in case of loss of some key components like disk failure. Now, a good database system is the one that must also recover in case of a sudden power loss and still roll back or undo all uncommitted user changes or transaction. Now, this is usually achieved by means of logging all transaction to a special file that will then be used in case data recovery if required. Now, Comet also serve another important function that is that they serve as the determining point at which changed data is visible to other users. 
let's just say a client address is being edited in a database system. Now, until the transaction is saved, other user who query the same client data should only see the address that was there before it was edited. Once committed, the new address permanently replaces the old one on disk and any user now querying the data not now is going to view the changed address. So the purpose of commit in here, in this code over here is basically to save the changes inside the database and the change which we have made in here is that we have actually created a table. After saving the changes to the database, what we are going to do is that we are actually going to write in db.close, which is going to actually close your database. So this was how to create your database, how to actually create a table inside that database with two entries, username and password, commit that changes which we have made to the users.db, which was creating a table and finally close your database. So this was it with the database part. In the next tutorial, what we are going to do is that we are actually going to get on with this widgets function and we are actually going to code this. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. So in this tutorial, as we promised, we are going to discuss the function where we are actually going to draw our widgets and we are actually going to code the function named as widgets. Now, basically these widgets basically deal with what we have right over here. That is this create account. We have got username, we have got password. Now, as you can see here that our login form is actually distributed in three phases. The first one is the create account. The second part is where we have this username and password and we click on the create account. So that is actually going to create an account for me. And the third phase is where we have this username and password and we click on the login part here. So basically our widgets function which we are going to code right over here we are going to write in def widgets and right inside here we are actually going to have three things so in the first phase what we are going to do is that we are going to create a variable which is going to be named as head which is going to be a simple label and inside this label what we are going to do is that we are actually going to add it to the root window which is the master window as well as you can see over here where we have written self.master equal to master which is the root window which has been received right in here in this constructor function so we are going to write in master after that what we are going to do is that we are going to write in here text equal to and the text is going to equal to a simple thing that is going to say login form or let's just write in it as panel. So it is going to be the login panel. After that, you can also specify the font here. So let's just say that I want to specify a specific font. And let's just say that I want the font to be 20. And I want the padding Y to be, let's just say 10. So it is not going to be like this. It is going to be enclosed in these parentheses. So the font is going to be 20. You can also write in if you want to, let's just say have Arial 20. So you can also do that as well. After that, what we are going to do is that we are going to write in self dot head and we are going to use in the pack method here. So before we get into the explanation, let's just correct an error here. It should be a dot, not a comma. It is going to be self dot master. So the Python pack method is basically kind of a geometry manager that packs widget relative to the earlier widget. Now Tkinter literally packs all the widget one after the other in a window. So we can use options like fill, we can use options like expand and side to control this geometry manager. Now compared to the grid manager, the pack manager is somewhat limited, but it is much easier to use in a few, but quite common situations. 
For example, like there may be a situation where you want to put a widget inside a frame and have it fill the entire frame. There also might be a situation where you want to place a number of widgets on top of each other. And there also might be a situation where you might want to place a number of widgets side by side. So that is where the pack method is going to help you. So this was the first part of basically the widgets function where we have got a simple label that is going to say login panel. That it. The next one is going to be for the username, password, and login and create account. So for that, what we are going to do is that we are going to write in self dot logf is going to equal to a frame. So right here we are about to create a frame inside the root window. And for that, we are going to specify a padding x of 10 and also a padding y of 10. After that, what we are going to do is that we are going to create a label. And this label is going to be self dot log f, which is actually the frame we just created. So this means that this label is going to get added to the frame. The text on this label is going to equal to username colon after that and the font which we are going to use is going to equal to 20. After that what we will do is that we are going to specify a pad y of 5. We are going to specify a pad x of 5 as well and right here we are going to use a grid function and a grid function is basically the one which is used to place things at a certain location so we are going to write in sticky equal to w after that what we are going to do is that we have actually created a text field that sorry a label that says username so for that we have to actually also create an entry field which is also going to get added to the frame which we have created log f. After that, we are going to write in a text variable which is going to equal to self dot username. We are going to specify a bd for that which is going to be five. We are going to specify a font for that as well which is going to be 15 and we are also going to specify the grid for that so for that we are going to write in dot grid where we are going to write in the row to be zero and we are going to specify the column to be column number one so that is going to actually place your username at a certain location so we will just copy this from here and we are going to paste it right over here again. And this one is now going to be for the password. So right here, we are going to make certain changes. So this one is going to be for password. The font is going to remain the very same, which is 20, the pad Y and pad X is going to remain the same. And the grid is also going to remain the same. For this one, we are going to change this one here to self dot password the bd is going to remain five font is going to remain the same what we are going to do is that we are going to specify the grid position which is now going to be row number one and column is also going to be number one in that case after that we have now got two labels username and password and we have also got the entry field of these as well now the next thing which we need to do over here is that we need to create two buttons. The first one is going to be the login button and the second button is going to be the create account button. So we are going to write an button. Now these uh, buttons are going to get added to the log F. Let me just scroll down a bit so that everything is visible. So it is going to be self dot log F. The text on the button is going to be login. We are going to specify a BD of one and we are also going to specify a font 
so the font is going to be 15 for the button we are going to specify the pad x to be 5 we are also going to specify the pad y to be 5 and we are also going to specify a command here that is when this button is clicked what is going to get executed so we are going to write in command and we are going to write an equal to self dot login so since this is the login function so what it is going to do is that when it is clicked upon it is going to call upon a function which is going to be named as login so after that what we are going to do is that we are also going to change the background color for the button which is going to be green and finally we are going to write in dot grid after that we are going to create one more button which is also going to get added to the log f the text on that button is going to equal to create account the bd for that button is going to equal to one the font for that button is going to be 15 and we are also going to specify the pad x to be 5 and the pad y to be 5 as well this time the command is going to change because the command for this one is going to be self dot cr which stands for create your new account and we are also going to change the background color and we are going to specify red as the color for that now for the grid of this button where this button is going to appear in your frame we are going to specify the row to be two and we are going to specify the column to be one so this was the second part where we have actually created the login frame where we have got username password we have got two buttons login and create account button now what we need to do is that we need to finally use the self.logf.pack which is going to actually pack this uh, frame which we created at the top and added these six items to it. Two labels, two entry fields and two buttons. The next one which we are going to create is going to be the CRF frame so it is going to be kind of the create account frame this one which was the log frame was basically for the login frame so now we are going to create the crf frame which is going to be the create account frame so we are going to write in self dot crf which is the create account so we are going to create a frame which is going to get added to the root window the pad x is going to be 10 and the pad by is also going to be 10. now inside this frame what we are going to do is that we are going to have two labels the user username and password and similarly we are going to have entry for those as well and we are also going to have two buttons the first one is going to be the create account button and the second one is going to be the button which is going to say go to now the login page after creating your account so what we will do is that we are going to actually copy all this from here way down here so to just save some time what we will do is that we are going to just paste it over here what we are going to do is that this time it is going to be the crf frame so we are going to change this to cr this one to cr this one to cr this one to cr as well and finally this one to cr as well and last one is going to be this one which is going to be the path part so now we are going to have certain changes as well now for the labels everything is good but for the entry fields now right here you can see that for the label where we have the text as username then for that the text variable which we have used is this username now you know that this is the username which we created right here at the top and as you can see that when you underline it it also is going to get underlined also so 
Now, as I told you, when we were creating these variable is that these two are for the user who already have an account and it exists in the database. Whereas this one is for those who are actually creating an, a new account and their data has yet to be fed into the database. So right here, as I told you that this is actually the login frame. So that's why the variables for the entry fields, which we have used for this username and password, which we have actually created at the top here in here. So now for the second one, the second frame, which we are creating for the create account frame, what we are going to do is that right here, since we are having this create account frame, so we are going to have this one as an underscore username. And this one over here is going to be an underscore password the remaining is going to remain the same now for the buttons what we are going to do is that for this one the text is not going to be login whereas the text is going to be create account and for this one the text here is going to be go to login so it is going to ask you to go to the login page whereas the commands are also going to change now for this one which is the create account the functions which is going to get called upon is basically going to be named as self dot new underscore user and for the second one where we have this the function which is going to be called upon is going to be the log function now we have not created these functions yet but we are going to create these so as you can clearly see now that we have got a lot of more things to do, you can see that we have got four functions which we now to create the login function, the new user function, the CR function and the log function. Now the CR function is the create account function. It is going to get called upon when you click on create account. And after you have created an account and clicked on the create account function, the new user function is going to get called upon the new user is going to get created. After that, you're going to click on the go to login button click on it and it is going to direct you to the log page which is right here at the top so it is going to direct you right over here so this function widgets basically defines the complete flow of the login and the create account thing the first thing which is going to get popped up is going to be this uh, login form you do not have an account click on the create account function it is going to direct you to the CR frame, which is right over here. Create an account, click on the create account button. It is going to create an account for you. After creating an account, click on the go to login and it is going to direct you right at the top over to this portion where you are going to just log in now because you have created your account right down here. One more thing is that for this one, we do not need the pack method because this is going to actually direct us to this page. And when you get directed to this page and after you click on the create account, it is going to actually, sorry, when you logged in, it is going to actually direct you to a new page, but this one is going to direct you right over here. So we don't need the pack method over here. So I hope that you have understood how we have created this widgets function. It is a kind of a messy thing, but it is, very simple to understand simple labels we have got simple entry fields we have got simple buttons which we have created and through those buttons we are actually going to call upon four functions which we have written names of here we are going to code them in the future tutorials so for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in python in the previous tutorial, we talked about the widgets function and we actually created the widgets which were for the login and creating account. Now from the previous tutorial and from the widgets function, we know that we are going to be coding on functions in this tutorial. So we will be coding the login function. We are going to be coding the CR named function. We are also going to code the new user function and we are also going to code the log function. Now for this tutorial, we are going to limit ourselves and we are going to only code this function that is the login function. Now this function login is going to get called upon whenever this button over here that says login is clicked. 
So, you know, when you click on the login button, what you want is that you want that the user must have already entered a username and a password. You are going to fetch those username and password. You are going to tally them with your database. And if it is a correct username and password or a valid username or password, what you're going to do is that you are going to allow the user the access to the application. So right down after this init function right here, what we are going to do is that we are going to create our login function. Now inside this login function, the first thing which I'm going to do is that I am going to establish connection. Now, as I told you that what the login button is going to do is that when you click on the login button, what it is going to do is that it is going to actually fetch the data from the database. So to fetch the data from the database, what you need to do is that you need to actually establish the connection. So we are going to establish the connection like this. We are going to write in with sqlite3.connect. And what we want to connect is the name of the database that is users.db. So we are also going to use an alias over here that is going to be named as db. And using that db, what we are going to do is that we are going to call upon the cursor function. Now we talked about the purpose of cursor function, why it is used. So the next thing which we are going to do after establishing the connection with the database is that we are going to find the user if there is any, then we are going to take proper action. Now to find the user, we are going to create a variable that is going to be named as find user. And in here, what we are going to do is that we are going to write in a query. So the query is going to look something like this, which is going to be select steric from user, which is the uh, table which we are talking about because we have already connected with the database that is users.db. So when we are connected, we are already inside the database that is named as users.db. So here, what we are going to do is that we are going to talk about the table from where we are going to fetch the data. So it is going to be select steric from the table named as users. And we are going to specify where the username is equal to question mark and the password is going to equal to question mark. Now, you know the question mark means that whatever you have entered in the fields which we have created right here in the widgets form, you can see that these are the entry fields which we have created. This one is for username and this one is the password one. So it is going to actually store this data inside the database and it is going to fetch that data accordingly to find the user. So it is going to actually find the user. After that, what it is going to do is that it is going to execute the query we just write in. So it is going to execute find a user, which is select static from user table where username and password are what we have entered. And what it is going to do is that it is going to have self dot username dot get. And it is also going to get me the password. So it is going to be self dot password dot get. All right, so it is going to also get me the password. After it has got me everything, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to write in a variable that is going to be named as result, and I'm going to make it equal to c.fetchAll. Now, the fetchAll is actually a function in Python. Now, this method that is fetch, it actually fetches all, or you can say, or all remaining rows of a query result set and return a list of tuples. Now, if no more rows are available, it is going to return an empty list. Now you must fetch all rows for the current query before executing new statements using the same connection. So here the query which we have is that you have to select the steric from user where the username equal to this and password equal to this. And it is going to fetch this one from here, which is actually the data which we have entered in the entry field. So it is going to find the user match it with these set of data 
using this query. So fetch all, what it is going to do is that it is going to execute the query which we have just written here. Now after executing the fetch all, what it is going to do is that it is going to now check it. Now if result, which means that if a user has been found, then what we are going to do is that we are going to write in self dot the log frame we are going to use the log frame because when you have logged in what you are now going to do is that you are going to call upon the pack forget on the log frame because when you have logged in you do not want the log frame anymore and that is exactly what is the purpose of the forget pack as well if you want to unmap any widget from the screen or top level then the forget method is used now there are two type of forget methods. You have got the forget pack and you have also got the forget grid, which are actually used with the pack and grid methods respectively. So here we are using the forget pack for the log frame because we want to unmap it from the top level or you can say from the screen because if the user which it was trying to find, if it has found that user, this means that we are ready to go inside the application. We don't want the lock screen anymore. So that's why we are going to write in log app dot pack forget. After that, what we are going to also do is that we are going to change the head text. So we are going to write in head text and we are going to make it equal to welcome. And we are also going to specify certain properties like we are going to do it not like this, but we are going to actually concatenate first self.username.get. So here you can see in the widgets column that we have specified the text to be the login panel at the top. So this was actually the head variable where it was all stored up. So once you have logged in, you do not want the text to be login panel, but you want to actually update this head and what you want to update it with is welcome. And you're also going to get the username for which the login has been performed and you're going to display its name. So it is going to be welcome, John, welcome, Alice, or whatever, or whoever has logged in into the system. Now, after welcoming the user, what our system is going to do is that it is also going to have the head configured up. So for that, we are going to write in head dot configure. And in the configure, what we are going to do is that we are going to specify a foreground of white color, let's say. We are going to specify a background of black and we are also going to specify a font here and the font for that is going to be mv and we are also going to specify the thickness of the text and also we are going to make the welcome message bold so what this is going to do is that it is going to configure the message which is going to be welcome and also the name of the user so this is going to configure it with the settings white foreground black background and this specific font now after it has done it what we need to do is that we need to specify the location or the grid you can say with where it is going to get placed so that's why we are going to write in fill equal to x so what that is going to do is that it is going to pack it upon. Now pack is also a function in Python. It is the easiest layout manager to code within Tkinter. So instead of declaring, declaring the precise location of a widget, what the pack method is going to do is that the pack method declares the position of the widget in relation to each other. Now there is a limitation to the pack method as well, just for knowledge purpose that in pack, it is actually limited in precision as compared to the place and grid method, which feature absolute position, whereas pack does not feature absolute positioning. Now it all depends upon how, which application you are working, how you want your system to be laid out. So it all depends on you that which function you want to use. So I want to use the pack method here. I want to use the fill equal to X and finally, this is going to be it. And at the very end, what I'm going to do is that when I have logged in, I have got into the system, 
what I want to do is that after a user has logged in, the user is ready to travel. So when a user, authentic user has logged in, he is ready to travel. So for that, we are going to call upon a class that is going to be named as travel and we are going to pass upon the main window route to it. So I hope that you have understood what we have covered in here. We have made a user logged in. We just connected the database. After that, we find the user. If there was a user, then we took some proper action regarding that. That was if result. At the very end, what we are going to do is that we are going to specify an else condition here. That is if a user has not been found from this query, which means that you entered some credentials which were not a part of the database. So for that, we are also going to have some backup, which is going to show an error message. And the error message is going to be simple username not in the database. Simple enough, it is going to be a simple message or you can say an error message. That is going to say that the username which you are trying to enter is not in the database. Very sorry, try in creating a new account or something like that. But we are going to just have this message username not in the database. So that is it with this tutorial. In the next tutorial, what we are going to do is that we are going to create a function that is going to be named as the new user function, which we have specified right down here in the widgets as well. I guess it was here. Yes, here it is. So we are going to be coding this function. This is actually to create a new account. So we are going to do that in the next tutorial. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. So in the previous tutorial, we talked about the login function. And in this tutorial, we are going to be talking about the new user function. So we will just get to it and we will just scroll it down a bit. That seems enough. So right here, we are going to code our new user function. Now in this new user function, the first thing which we are also going to do is that we are going to establish this connection we have. So we will just copy this from here and we are going to just paste it over here. That is to establish the connection with the database. Now you might be thinking that we are creating a new user. Why we have to use the database for that? The reason is that when you want to create a new user, the first thing which you are going to do is that you are going to find if you are trying to create a duplicate account because you know that unique usernames should be entered. Two usernames which are identical, that is not allowed. So here also the first thing which we are going to do is that we are going to find for an existing username. If there is any, we are going to take proper action. We are not going to allow the user to create an account with the same username which already exists in the database. Also, when we create a new user or a new account, after it, is, it has checked if there is if there does not exist any account with the same name, so it is going to allow us to create a new account and also it is going to insert that new data into the database for future use. So that's why we need the connection to our database here. Now, after establishing a connection to the database, as I told you, the next thing which we are going to do is that we are going to check if the user already exists. So what we are going to do in that case is that we will just copy this from here again. And we will just paste it over here. That is going to select steric from user where username equal to this, password equal to this. And it is going to execute it for find user. We do not want a comparison of the password because you know that two passwords can be identical, but two usernames, now that is something that is not allowed. So that is going to be, I guess it. So it is going to find the user, execute this query we have that is to select user from username and password. It is going to match it with the username.get. It's going to get that from the entry field, compare it with the database, now, if it uh, execute any error where we are going to write an if c dot fetch all, which means that if the database fetched any data for us for that specific user, which means that the user already exists. So if the user already exists, 
what we need to do is that we are going to just write in show error and we are going to say that username already taken simple enough let me explain it again it is going to actually execute this query now fetch all as i told you in the explanation as well that fetch all is going to actually return a result set or a list of tuples so here it is going to return a result set only if there was a match found in the database which means that the user for which you want to create an account already exists in the database so if it gets any data out this means that this is going to be true which means that you should not allow the user to create an account because that username was already taken now in the else part which is if uh, the database does not return any data using fetch all which means that the account does not exist that is where we are going to start creating the account so for that we are going to just write in ms dot show info and for in the show info we are going to write in account created simple enough and after that we are going to call in the log function so after the account has been created what you are going to do is that you are going to go to the log function because when you have created the account you need to actually log in again so this is the log function which we are going to create in a moment so now to create an account what we are going to do is that right here we are going to create an insert variable and what we are going to do is that we are going to write in a query that is going to say insert into the table that is user and what we want to insert is the username and the password which we just entered so we are going to insert those and what we want to insert for those are the values so we want to insert the values and which are those values for that we are going to specify question mark question mark which means whatever we have entered in the entry fields now after that the next thing which we are going to do is that we are going to execute this query for that we are going to write in execute and we are going to execute insert which is the query and we are also going to get the data from the entry fields for that we are going to write in self dot and underscore username which is the new username dot get and we are also going to get the password but what we will do is that we are going to actually get this inside parenthesis so now right down here we are going to specify a comma brackets again and we are going to write in self dot new password dot get so it is going to get us that data from the entry fields username is going to cope up with this this one over here goes with this this value goes with the first question mark and this value goes with the second question mark which means that it is going to actually execute the data and finally the last thing which you need to do is that you need to write in db dot comet which means that we want to commit from the database so i hope that you have understood how we have created a new user now these you these variables which i have used you might remember from the widgets function those were the one we created for the crf frame that was the create account frame where we have got n username for this entry field that is for username and for the second entry field where the label is password you have got this entry field date that says n underscore password that stand for the new password so these are the variables which we are going to use here in the new user function and username and password are the one which we are going to use right over here so that is it in the next tutorial what we are going to do is that we are going to code the remaining two functions of our first class that is the user class and we are going to code 
the CR function and we are also going to code the log function. And these are here known as the frame packing method. So the frame packing methods are going to be covered in the next tutorial. For this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are covering how to create a cap booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we have covered what you can see right in front of you. That was how to create a new account for a new user. Now in that, you know that we called upon a log function whenever there was a success in creating an account. So that is exactly what we are going to do right here. We are going to code the frame packing methods here. Now the frame packing methods are very simple. The purpose of them is to just set the username and password to empty for both the frames, for the log frames and for the create account frame whenever you visit them for the first time. It is going to call upon the pack forget function. They are going to modify the text of the head object. Now head object is the one that shows welcome messages and the login or the create account thing. So it is going to update those. And it is also going to call upon the locked f dot pack and crf dot pack to actually position your elements. So right down here, we are going to code the first one that is going to be lock. Now inside this function, what we are going to do is that, as you can see over here, that when you called upon the lock function after an account has been created, so when an account has been created, the system is going to now ask you to log in with those credentials with which you have actually created your new account. So to do that, when you go to the log, what it is going to simply do is that it is going to actually get the fields ready for you. By fields ready, I mean that it is going to set the username to empty, which means that it is going to allow you to enter something it is going to have the password dot set and it is going to set this to empty as well also what it is going to do is that since we are now working with the log frame so we want to forget the crf frame which was the create account frame because you have actually created your account and you have called upon the log function here so we will also write in self dot crf dot pack forget so you are going to call upon the pack forget for the create account frame because you are now in the login frame you are going to update the head text so we are going to write in head text and it is going to equal to login because now you are on the login page and finally what it is going to do is that it is going to configure or you can say position your login frame using the pack function so this was the frame packing method for the log. The second frame packing method is going to be for the create account. Now that is when you're on the login page, but you do not have an account there. So you are going to click on the create account button. And when you click on the create account button, what we want to do is that now we have got the variables for username and password, but this time we are going to use the one we have created for the create account. So that those are going to be the n underscore username dot set. We are going to set this to empty. We are going to set the password to empty. And we are going to now call upon the back forget but this time we are going to call it for the log one. So we are going to write in back forget. We are going to configure the head text and head text this time is going to be create account because now we are on the create account frame and we want the head text to be create account simple enough and the last thing which we need to do is that we need to call upon the back method on the crf frame it is going to position your frame accordingly so these are the frame packing methods we have the lock and the cr frame they do nothing both do the same job the first one set the username and password empty for you to log in the second one also set the end username and end password for you 
empty so that you can enter new credentials to create a new account. Lock frame actually removes the CRF frame. The CR frame, the CR function actually forgets the lock frame. The head text is going to be login for the lock. Head text for the CR is going to be create account. And finally, the positioning one for the log F and CRF accordingly with the log and CR frame respectively. So that was it. We have actually created whatever we were calling from the widgets function right here. So we are done with it. Now you can see that the one which we are not done with is the application travel route. And that is exactly where all of our remaining code is going to go in. We are going to do the traveling part right here. We have actually logged a user up till now. If he does not have an account, we have created an account for him. Tell him to log in with those credentials which for with which he has created an account. And now he is ready to travel. So when he's ready to travel, we are ready to code that. So in the next tutorial, we are going to get to it. For this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. And I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey, guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. In this tutorial, we are going to start the part two of our application. In the first part, we allowed the user to create an account if he does not have any. Log in with those credentials. If he already has an account, he can just simply log in and now he is ready to travel. Now, traveling is exactly what we are going to be doing right here. So, right after here, we are going to code the second class which we are going to work in. That is going to be named as the travel class. So, right down here, right up here, sorry, you can see that we have called upon this right here you can see that we have already called upon the instance or you can say the constructor function here so right here the first thing which we are also going to do is that we are going to create the construction constructor function for this so we passed upon the root window so we are also going to receive the root window here now inside the constructor function, the first thing which we need to do is that self dot root equal to root, which is the most important thing. After that, we need to specify a root title. So we are going to write in self dot root dot title. That is going to equal to taxi, or you can just write in cap booking system. So it is going to be cap booking system. We are going to write in self dot root dot geometry we are going to have geometry over here and we are also going to call upon the configure on the root so we are going to write in configure and we are going to configure it with a background color that is going to be black and Finally, we are going to make a resizable window. So we want to have root dot resizable. And in the resizable, we are going to write in width equal to false. And we are also going to specify the height to be false. So this was for the root window. Now in the constructor function here, we are going to have a lot of variables. We are going to have variables for everything right inside this constructor function so right here we are going to start on with the date of order which is when the taxi was or the cab was actually ordered so it's going to be at the uh, string variable so this is going to be the type of it we are also going to write in date of order dot set and we are going to use the module which we have imported it was the time module so we are going to write an strf time and we are going to use person d percent month and we are going to have percent year so this is going to be the format in which your date of order is going to be displayed 
After that, you are going to have a variable for the receipt. So we are going to have receipt reference and that is going to also be a string variable. Also, we are going to have one for the paid tax. That is also going to be a string variable. Let me just copy it because we are going to need a lot of it. So paid tax is going to be string variable. Then we are going to have the subtotal, which is going to be displayed at the very end. That is the total of how much you have to pay the cab. We are also going to have the total cost, which is going to get generated after everything, like the taxes, things are added up. Then we are also going to need variables like VAR1. Now this is not going to be a string VAR. It is going to be an int VAR, integer variable. We are also going to have variable two. We are going to have variable three. Now we are also going to have variable four. That is also going to be int VAR. Now the journey, Type is also going to be here, which is again going to be int VAR. Now you're going to understand why we are creating all of these variables. These are the one which we are going to be using. There is also going to be a variable for the car type, and it is also going to be an int VAR. Then we are also going to have variables with the same name VAR1. But this time we are going to be string VAR. We are going to have VAR, which is going to be a string VAR. And we are also going to have VAR, which is going to be a string variable. We are also going to have a reset counter as well, which is going to be to zero for the initial values. Now we are also going to have certain variables which we will be needing. Let me just scroll down a bit. All right, now we are also going to have a variable for the first name, which is going to be a string VAR. We are also going to have a variable for surname, which is going to be a string VAR. We are also going to have a one for the address. We are going to have one for the postcode. We are going to have one for the mobile number, which is going to be a string VAR. We are going to have one for the telephone number, which is going to be a string VAR. And we are also going to have one for the email address, which is going to be again VAR. So these are kind of the user information or the user data, which we are going to need. The first name, surname, address, postcode, mobile, telephone, and the email address. Now comes the part where we are going to have the cab tax, which is going to be a VAR string variable. We are going to have the kilometer, which is going to be the distance. So it is going to be VAR. We are going to have a variable with the travel insurance, which is going to be a string VAR. We are going to have one for luggage which is going to be a string var we are going to have one for the receipt which is going to be string var as well i guess i misspelled it, it should be e i p t now we are also going to have uh, variables for the car types so you might be traveling in a standard vehicle which is going to be a string VAR. We are going to have some cars here, like the Ford Galaxy, which is going to be a string VAR. And let's just say that we have also got the Ford Mandu, which is going to be string VAR as well. So it should be F O, not F P. So let me just scroll down a bit. So we have got the car type as well now. Now what we need to do is that we need to set certain variables like the text which we have just initialized. So we are going to set the text for initial to zero. We are going to set the kilometer which is the distance. Also to 
zero. We are also going to set the travel insurance. So we are going to write in travel insurance set to zero. And we are also going to have luggage dot set to zero. So these are initial values because when a new users come in, everything should be zero. Also, the car type, which is going to get selected like standard car, it should also be set zero. The Ford Galaxy should be set to zero and the Ford Mondo should also be set to zero. So let's just remove it from here. So these are the variables with which we are going to be working up. So from these variables, you might get an idea of what we are going to be doing along this. And right here, I guess we missed the set function. Yes, we did. And now it is good. So these are the variables which we are going to be using inside this entire travel class or the second part or the cab booking system. So we have initialized all of these variables inside this constructor function here, and we are going to use it starting on from the next tutorial. So for this tutorial, that is it. I know it was a boring tutorial, but variables are needed whenever you want to code anything. So this was the tutorial for that. So that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cab booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we started on with the second part where we are going to do the traveling stuff and we coded things in the constructor function. Now in this tutorial, what we are going to do is that we are going to do something like which we did for the first class, which was right here. That was how to initiate the first class. So in this tutorial, what we are going to do is that we are going to start on with the main frame or the main code of the second part that is the travel class. So what we are going to do is that right over here, what we are going to do is that I'm going to just add a hashtag where I'm going to write in mainframe. That is where our mainframe code is going to go. Now in the mainframe, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create a variable first that is going to be named as mainframe. And through that, I'm going to actually create a frame in the main window that is the root window. Now root window is something we received here in the constructor function as well, which is the main window, which is going to pop up after you have logged in successfully. So this is going to be the frame window. Now what I'm going to do with this frame window is that I'm going to have a pack map with it. So I'm going to write in main frame dot pack. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to write in fill equal to both. And I'm going to make the expand equal to true. All right. So after that, what I'm going to do is that I am going to create uh, multiple frames here. Now, the reason I'm going to create multiple frames is just look at this image. This is the output image, which is what we want to achieve at the very end. So here, basically, you can see that you have got a top frame where you have got this welcome message and you have got this taxi booking system thing. After that, you can see that you have got this frame, which can, contains the customer info. And you can see that you've got a frame as a whole as well. Whereas inside that frame, you have got one frame, which includes the customer information. Then you have got a frame, which got the information to the booking details. Then you can see that you have got one frame right down here, where you have got the paid tax, the subtotal and the total cost here. So that is exactly what we are going to do. We are going to create multiple frames and we are going to actually decorate this entire setup. And we are also going to attach functions with these buttons, which you can see right down here as well. So this is exactly what we want to achieve from our mainframe. And also when we code this mainframe in the very same we did for the login function that when you click on a button, a command is going to get executed. We are going to do that stuff as well but we are going to split that into multiple tutorials because this is going to be a lot of GUI. So I'm not going to confuse you guys. We are going to cover that in a series of tutorials so that you can grasp everything. So in this tutorial, we are going to 
limit ourselves to the top frame. So I'm going to create a variable tops. And using that, I'm going to create a frame which is going to get added to the main frame because main frame is something over here which contains every information you can see right here in this image. So we are going to add that into the main frame. We are going to add a BD to it. So we are going to make it 10. We are going to change the background color. Now, these are the things which uh, are not a necessity. You can choose a background color of your own choice. It is not imperative that you have to go with black. So width is going to be 800 and we are going to write in relief equal to red. So this is the GUI which I have selected. We have covered the basics to Tikenter. You can go there, study Tikenter GUI, and then you will be able to decorate your output the way you want to. And after that, we are going to call upon the back function where we are going to write in the site to be top, as you can see here in this image as well, that this frame is very at the very top. So the site for the pack method is going to be top. And we are going to call in fill as well that. So fill is going to equal to both. After that, what I'm going to do is that I am going to have this one here as well. That says the taxi booking system here. So for that, what I'm going to do is that I am going to create self dot LBL till and we are going to make it equal to a label and this label is going to get added to the tops frame we are going to select a certain font for it so the font which we are going to choose is going to be MP and we are going to have 30 as the thickness and we are also going to make it bold and we are going to specify the text which we want to use here. So we are going to write in text. Yes, and we are going to make it equal to cab booking system. So this is going to be it. After that, what I'm going to do is that I am going to specify self dot label title dot grid which means that it is going to take upon the grid which is the default one so that is going to be it with the tops frame what we can also do is that we can have certain things with this as well here so let me just move it to a new line so that it is all visible we'll just scroll it down add a commander. So right here we can also specify a background. So the background is going to be let's just say black. And we are going to specify a foreground color which is going to be white. We are going to add a BD of 10 and we are also going to use the anchor here which is going to be W here. So these are certain properties which we have added. So finally, we have we are going to just close it and specify the grid which we have already did. So this was the first frame which we have created in this tutorial. That is the tops frame, which is going to have the cap booking system at the very top. In the next tutorial, what we are going to do is let me just open the image again. And in the next tutorial, we are going to have the label frame where we are going to have these we are going to have the customer details so stay tuned for that tutorial where we are going to cover that so for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we talked about the main frame and we also added the first frame that was the top frame. In this tutorial, we are going to talk about the customer frame details. Now, let's just get to it. So right down here, what we are going to do is that we are going to add a comment so that everything is visible. So we are going to write in customer frame 
details and that is exactly what we are going to do so the first thing which we are going to do is that we are going to create a variable with the same name that is the customer details frame and we are going to make it equal to a label frame so this is going to get added to the main frame where we are going to have the width the width is going to be 400 we are going to specify the height to be 400 and we are going to have bd equal to 20 we are going to add a padding of y to 5 and we are going to also have the relief equal to reg after that what i'm going to do is that i'm going to call upon the customer frame details dot pack and with the pack method i'm going to write in the side to be bottom and fill is going to be obviously called upon with put and we are going to make the expand equal to true as well so the expand is going to be true after that what we are going to do is that we are going to have a variable that is going to be named as frame details and frame details is going to equal to a frame which is going to get added to the frame we just created that is the customer details frame let me just scroll it down a bit so that it is visible so that's exactly where we are working so it is going to get added to the customer details frame where the width is going to be 480 we are going to have a height of 300 the bd is going to be 10 and the relief is going to be rich let me just scroll it back after that what i'm going to do is that i'm going to call upon frame details dot pack and with the pack method i'm going to specify the side to be left and fill is going to equal to both and expand is going to be true the third thing which we are going to do over here is the customer name which is going to be a label frame again so it is going to be a label frame it is going to get added to the frame details and we are going to specify certain parameters here which are going to be width which is going to be 150 we are going to specify the height to be 250 and the bd is going to be 10 in this case and we are going to specify a font so font is going to equal to arial and the thickness is going to be 12 and we are also going to make it bold and the text for this is going to equal to customer info so that is it customer info and finally we are going to specify relief to be rich All right, let me just scroll it back a bit. So as you can see clearly that this is the customer name. And for that, you can see that we have specified the customer info, which is at the very top. So as you can see that what we are doing here is that we are writing the customer details frame, which means that we are specifying everything that is at the top. That includes the customer info here. We have got the booking details over here as well so that these are the two things which we are specifying here mainly so the next thing which we are going to have is going to be right after this so let's just scroll back a bit and the second one which we are going to create is going to be the travel frame which is also going to be a label frame so in the travel frame we are going to also add it to the frame details where we are going to specify the bd to be 10 we are going to specify the width 
to be 300, we are going to specify the height to be 250. And we are going to specify the font, which is going to be the very same. So we will just copy this from here. And we will just paste it over here. So this is going to be the font. And we are going to specify the text to be the booking details. And finally, we are going to specify the relief, which is going to be rich. After that, what we are going to do is that we are going to have the cost frame. So we are going to create one more variable here, which is going to be cost frame, which is also going to be a lib frame, which is going to get added to the frame details and the width for this one is going to be three to zero the height is going to be 150 the bd is going to be five and the relief is going to be flat this time so relief is going to be flat now before we quit on with this tutorial the last thing which we need to do over here is that for these three things the customer name the travel frame and for the cost frame what we need to do is that we need to actually create the grids for that so for the first one we are going to write in customer name dot grid and for the customer name dot grid we are going to specify the row to be zero and we are going to specify the column to be zero as well so we will just copy this from here and for the second one we are going to write in travel frame dot not dot dot but dot rate where this time the row is going to be zero but we are going to just change the column here and finally for the cost frame we are going to write in cost frame dot grid where this time the row is going to be one and the column is also going to be one so that was all about the customer frame details which we have just covered in this tutorial you can see that you have created a customer details frame which is actually a label frame which is going to get added to the main frame then we have uh, got the frame details which got added to the first frame we just created which was the frame details now for the frame details we've got three things the customer name the travel frame and the cost frame all of these three were added to the frame details which was added to the customer details so i hope that you have understood the hierarchy in which these are actually added to uh, to this so I guess we have also made a mistake here, which is H E I G H T. My bad. It was misspelled. All right, so it is good now. In the next tutorial, what we will be doing is that we are going to talk about more frames. So, as I told you, that a couple of tutorials are basically going to be allocated for the Tikinder part. So, it is going to be a bit boring, but you have to do the GUI so that you can just skip on to the functions part then. So that is it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we talked about the customer frame details and in this tutorial, we are going to talk about, let me just show you, we are going to talk about this very right side that has got this image. So what we are going to do is that we will not waste any time and we will just get to it. So we will just scroll down a bit so that everything is visible and right down here is what we are going to do the code. So right here I'm going to just write in the image part I guess. All right. So that is going to just for the splitting purpose. So right here what we are going to do is that I am going to create a receipt underscore button frame and it is going to be actually a label frame which is going to get added to the customer details frame and we are going to just specify some GUI with it where BD is going to be 10 the width 
is going to be 350. The height is going to be 300. And we are going to specify the relief, I guess. Yes, relief is remaining. So it is going to be this. So after that, what we are going to do, to do is that we are going to have the receive bottom frame dot pack. And for the pack method, we are going to pack it to the right side as you have seen that it is at the right side. So we are going to just write and fill, which is going to be both. And the expand is going to be true. After that, as you can see that in that frame, you have got an image. So what we will do is that we are going to write and receive bottom frame dot picture. And it is going to equal to photo image. And this is actually a built-in function photo image that is going to help you to load images to your frames. So photo image is going to have in the parameters the location of the image which it wants to load. So right here we are going to write in the location which is going to be the same directory which we are working it and we are going to name it as thank you dot and I don't know the format so we are going to for now let's just stick it to PNG. Now as you can see that for now you do not have the image but we are going to load it when we will run the code. So don't worry about that. So we have got this image inside that frame we just created and now what we are going to do is that we are going to write and receive bottom frame but label and that is going to equal to a label which is going to get added to the receive bottom frame. And right here, we are going to write an image, which is going to equal to the received bottom frame dot picture. So that is it. And finally, what we are going to do is that we are going to write in received bottom frame dot label dot back. So here you can see clearly that what we have done here is that we have loaded a picture inside this variable here. After that, we created a label, added it to the received bottom frame, which we created at the very top. And for that label, what we did is that we loaded the image on top of that area, which was the picture we just loaded using the photo image here. And finally, we called upon the dot label dot pack for the received bottom frame. So I hope that you have understood that how we have actually loaded the image here. So that is going to actually do this part, which is at the very right side, which says, thank you for visiting us. We are going to load the image later. We are going to download that image and we are going to put it in the directory here. And I'm also going to add it at the very end of this uh, application so that you can also download it and then load it. So I guess that is it with this tutorial as well. In the next tutorial, we are going to talk about the customer information. So we are going to deal with some customer information in the next tutorial where we are going to talk about, let me just show you. So we are going to talk about this part where we have the first name, we have got the surname, the address, the postcode, the mobile and the email. So we are going to do that. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. I know it has been going boring for uh, for some time, but I assure you when we skip to the functions part, you are going to enjoy that. So in this tutorial, what we are going to do is that we are going to code the customer information GUI, which is at the very left corner. And as I told you, we are going to talk about the first name, surname, address, postcode, mobile, and the email. So let's just get to it. So we don't need this for over here for sure. So right here, we are going to add a bag, which is going to be customer information. So starting on with the very first one, that is the first name. So right here, the label is going to be for the first name, which is going to be a label and which is going to get added to the customer name, 
Now customer name, I guess we misspelled it. So customer name is what we have, I guess, created here. Here it is. So this is what we have created. So we'll just copy this from here. And we will just write in customer name over here. So this was what we were talking about. So now the frame which we have created, that was the customer name. We are going to add the customer information to that frame. So we are going to specify the font to be Arial. It is going to have 14 as the text width and we are going to make it bold as well. For the text part, we are going to write in text and the text is going to equal to first name. So this is going to be the text. We are going to specify a BD as well, which is going to be seven in this case. Now for this label, what we are also going to do is that as you can see that we have added it to the customer name frame and the customer name frame is the one which is right over here. This one is it. So now we are going to specify the grid for that as well. So to specify the grid, what you're going to do is that you're going to write in self dot label first name dot grid. And the grid is not equal to, but it is going to be brackets where the row is going to equal to zero. The column is also going to equal to zero. And we are going to specify the sticky and the sticky is going to equal to w after that we are also going to specify the entry field for this first name so to do that we are going to write in self dot txt first name so it's going to be the text for the label we have created so it is going to equal to an entry field, which is going to allow you to enter a name. So it is also going to get added to the customer name for sure. We are going to make the font, which is going to remain the very same. So let's just copy this from here, paste it over here. So this is going to be the font. After that, we are going to write in text variable. The text variable for that is going to equal to first name now this text variable is the one we created here at the top with the name first name which is right here so now you can see that why we created all those labels so one by one we are now going to use all of those we are going to use all of these which i have just highlighted in this very tutorial we are covering here so we have used one already which was the first name which is going to act as the variable here for the uh, entry field uh, for the first name. So BD is going to be seven. We are going to have insert width to be two and we are going to have uh, justify, which is going to equal to weight. After that, in the very same way, we are going to specify the grid. So it is going to be the first name dot Great. Now you know that the row is going to remain the very same, but the column is going to change. So it is going to be row number very same and column is going to be one. So what it is going to do is that it is going to place first name over here. And in front of that, you are going to get your entry field where you will be allowed to actually enter your uh, first name. So this was for the very first one. For the second one, what we are going to do is that we will just copy this from here and we are going to make certain changes to save some time. So we are going to just paste it over here and in place of first name, we are going to just replace it with surname. So this one is also going to be replaced with surname. This one is also going to replace with surname. And this one over here is also going to get replaced with surname. So now what we are going to do is that the text for the second one here, it is going to be surname and we don't want this end to be capital. So it is going to be surname. 
Now what we are also going to do is that for this one, the text variable equal to surname is not going to be it. We are going to change it to surname, which is the second variable in here, which we have used. You can see right here that this one is it. So this, this is it. What we need to do is that now we need to change the columns here. So what we need to do is that we need to change the row to one. Column is going to remain the same and it is going to be row one, column one, and that is going to be it. And I guess we are going to just paste it again. And this time what it is going to be for is that it is going to be for the third field that is the address. So what we will do is that we are going to just write in address hill, address, let's just copy this, paste it over here. This is going to be the label for the address and this is going to be the text address. So what we will do is that we are going to just remove this from here and right here we are going to write in address. So that is going to be it. We are going to also add the variable named as address which we have created at the top and we need to make changes here. The row this time is going to remain get two and the column information is going to remain the very same column number zero and column number one so we will just copy this again and we are going to just paste it again and i guess we are making the right changes here so we are going to verify that later so the next one is going to be for i guess the postcode yes it is so what we will do for that is that in place of this address here now we are going to write in post code we'll just copy this and we are going to change this to post code we are going to change this to post code and we are also going to change this to post code now right here we are also going to change this to post code and 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 we are going to also change this to Postcode. So this is the variable we have at the top and what you need to do is that you need to make the row to be three here and row to be three here as well. So just copy this, paste it again, let's just move it down a bit and let's just scroll down a bit as well. And the next one is going to be for the mobile number. So what we will do for that is that in place of this we are going to write in mobile this one is also going to change to mobile not mp but mo this one is also going to get changed to mobile and this one is also going to get changed to mobile now we are also going to change the text here, which is going to be mobile. And we are also going to use the variable we have at the top that is mobile. So we are also going to change the row to be four and the column is also going to be four and we will just copy all of this again. So we will just paste it again, scroll down a bit so that we can only see this so we don't just mix it up. All right, so the next one and the last one is for the last variable we have that is email. So let's just minimize that. And right here in place of mobile, we are going to just write email. Email here. Email here. And finally, we are also going to have email here. So the row is going to be five in this case for both and we are going to change this one. This one is going to be for email and this one is also going to be email as well. So if we just go at the very top, you can see that all of these have been changed, which means that we have used all of these. 
And I guess we didn't use the telephone. Let's just ignore the telephone. We have got the mobile number of a user. We can just call him if you want to convey something. We don't need the telephone number. So that is it with the customer information. We have got the first name. We have got the surname. We have got the address. We have got the postal code. We have got the mobile number and we have also got the email of the user. We have also specified the specific grids for every user. So I guess that is going to be it. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cab booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we talked about the customer information where we coded the leftmost frame, which you can see right here. In this tutorial and in the next tutorial, we are going to talk about this part that contains the booking details. So in this tutorial, we are going to limit ourselves to the top three, the pickup, drop and pooling. And in the next tutorial, we are going to talk about the base charge distance and the traveling insurance so let's just focus on this tutorial where we have to deal with the pickup drop and pulling now as you can see at the right side you can see that you've got these arrows which means that these are going to be drop down menus from which you can actually select an option now for the pickup you are going to actually have the train station which you want to pick up also at the drop you are going to have a station where you want to actually uh, go so this is going to be the pickup location for the driver this is going to be the drop location where you want to actually go and this is going to be for the pooling part where we are going to have pooling to be either one two three or four so these are going to be three drop down menus which we are going to create in this tutorial so let's just get to it and right here we are going to have the let's just say cabin four so this is going to be the part where we are going to have the cab information. So right down here, the first thing which we are going to do is that we are going to create a label for the pickup. So we are going to write in self dot LBL pick up, which is going to equal to a label. Now this label is going to uh, get added since we are about to now travel and want to add traveling information. So that's why we are going to be using this frame which we have created. That is the travel frame. So right down here, what we are going to do is that we are going to write in travel frame. So that we are going to specify a font which is going to be Arial. It is going to have 14 as thickness and it is also going to be bold. So after that, we are going to specify the text for that. So we are going to write in text and text for that is going to equal to simply pick up and we are going to specify BD to be seven. After that, what we need to do is that we need to have label cup dot grid. Now for this frame, since we are starting on with this frame, so it is going to be at the very top. So row is going to equal to zero and the column is also going to equal to zero for us and we are also going to write in sticky equal to and w all right so the next thing which we are going to do is that now what we are going to do is that we are going to create the drop down box for it now you can see that what we have done so far is we have only written this label that says pickup now we are going to deal with this drop down menu now to create this drop down menu what we are going to do is that we are going to create a CBO pick up and this one is going to equal to TTK dot a combo box. So combo box actually creates a drop down menu. It is not going to be tab error, but it's going to be the travel frame where it is going to get added. And now we are also going to use the text variable here that is going to be var1 so var1 is what we are going to use here now there might be a slight uh, issue with this var1 because if you look at the top here 
where we have actually created our variables. So you can see that you have got var1 as an int variable and var1 as a string variable as well. Now we want to actually use this string one over here. Now, as you can see that it has actually got this string variable, but what if it doesn't? So what we are going to do is that we are going to add a diversion here so that both of these are a bit different. So we are going to just add L, all of these three, var l1, var l2, var l3. So that, now these three are actually distinguished. Now, as you can see that now it is using this one, which is exactly what we do not want. So what we will do is that we are going to add just this L over here so it is going to get that one with the type string variable so after that we are going to specify the state to be read only and after specifying the state we are going to specify the font now the font for that is going to be arial it is going to have 20 as thickness and also it is going to be bold after that, we are going to specify the width for the combo box, which is going to be 14. So this is going to be our combo box. Now what we are going to do is that now we are going to add values to our combo box. Now to add values to your combo box, you have to write in CBO box pickup, square brackets, value inside here, which means that now we are adding values to it so the first value is going to be empty which is going to be the default value which is when you run the code this one is going to be auto selected so that uh, nothing is inside that and you are allowed to have whatever you want so now you can add a three uh, or four or five or whatever number of stations you would like to add here so what we are going to do is that we are going to add let's just say four stations here so let's just say i'm going to write in Let's just say the arcade lane, which is going to be location number one. I'm going to add, let's just say the fourth, which is going to be the second location. Let's just say the uh, the cinema, let's just say, which is going to be the third location. Now let's just say we are going to add the fourth, fourth one as the railway station. So this is going to be the fourth uh, one so these are the four uh, values which we have added we have got arcade lane the fourth cinema and we have got the railway station so now what you need to do is that you need to call upon self dot cbo pickup dot current is going to be zero now by this we means that when you run the code what is going to be the first value which is going to be auto selected so when you run the code it is going to select this value which is the which is going to act as the current value or you can say the default value which is going to be the zeroth which is as you can see the empty value so after that we are going to specify the grid finally it's going to be cbo box dot grid and in the grid what you are going to do is that you are going to write in row to be zero and you are going to specify the column one so this is going to be the first label and the first cbo box we have just created so now for the second part what we will do is that now we are going to do the copying stuff because we have coded one we are not going to code second so what we will do is that we will just scroll down up till here and now for the second one, we are going to have, you can see here that we are going to have the drop label and the drop combo box. So here, what we are going to do is that the label this time is going to be the label drop. And it is going to get added to the travel frame. All we need to do is to change this text here we need to also change the grid here the row is going to be one the column is going to remain the same and for the combo box what we need to do is that we need to change this one which is going to be varl2 now and 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 what we need to also do is that we need to have this one not as cbo pickup but it is going to be cbo drop this one over here is also going to be cbo drop 
this one is also going to be CBO drop. And finally, this one is also going to be CBO drop. Just remove this P, everything is going to get solved up. So now, as you can see that we have got our combo box, we have added it to the travel frame. The text variable we use was VARL2. The rest is going to remain the very same. All you need to do is that you need to just change the grid for the end, uh, so for the draw box, which is now going to be row one and column one. The values here that the arcade lane, the fort, the cinema, and the railway station are going to remain the very same. So it is going to be either you are starting on with, let's just say arcade lane and your drop is going to be railway station, or if your uh, pickup is at the railway station, maybe your drop is at the fort. So the pickup locations and the drop locations are going to remain the very same because this is the area where our taxi service is actually operating. So that's why they are going to remain the very same. The last thing which we are going to do for this is the pulling part. So for this, we are going to copy this again and we will just paste it again. And what we will do is that we will just, 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 just scroll it towards here so that it don't get mixed up. Now we are going to create a variable which is going to be the pooling variable. So we are going to write in pooling and, and, and the text is going to change to pooling here. The variable is going to be the variable number three and it is not going to be pickup, but it is going to be pooling. This one is going to be the CBO Pooling. This one is also going to change to CBO pooling. This one is also going to change to CBO pooling. And finally, this one is also going to change to pooling. I guess we, we forgot to have some changes here. Yes, we did. This one over here should be the label drop. And I guess everything is good. All right, so let's just scroll back. So now we have got, we have changed the text here. We have changed the variable here. And what we need to change more are the values here because now we do not want these values. What we want is that we want one hill. We want not at the rate, but two hill. We want three here and we want four here. So this is going to be the pooling. Now for the current value, what we are going to do is that we are going to change this to one. And the row is obviously going to change. It is going to be row number two, column number one. And for the top hill, it is going to be row number two and column number zero. I guess we also change this for the top frame where we have got this one. So it is going to be row one, column one, and it is going to be row one, column zero. All right, everything is in perfect order. So I guess uh, that is it. We have coded what I told you. We will be coding these three labels and the combo boxes for these three variables. In the next tutorial, we are going to talk about the base charge, the distance, and the traveling and insurance. And as you can see at the left, these are actually check boxes. So this is exactly what we are going to code in the next tutorial. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cab booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we talked about the first uh, three things we have got about the cab information or the booking details, which were the pickup, drop, and polling. So in this tutorial, we are going to complete that. And we are going to talk about base charge, distance, and traveling insurance. So right here, basically, you can see that you have got first this checkbox. And after this uh, checkbox, you have got this label that says the base charge, 
And after that, you can see that you have also got this kind of an entry field where you are allowed to enter the value for the base charge. Now, this value is going to be auto calculated. You don't have to calculate it. So what we are going to do is that we will just move in here. And since we are talking about cab information, so we don't need to add any hashtag. So right here, the first thing which we are going to do is that we are going to create a check cab text, which is going to be a check button. So it is going to be this one. Now this check button is going to get added to the travel frame. The text on this one is going to be the base charge. So as you can see here, we are creating this one over here that says the base charge. So we are creating check button, getting added, getting it added to the uh, travel frame. The text for that is going to be the base charge. And we are going to add a static here, which means that it is imperative to add it. So after that, we are going to use the variable here. Now the variable which we are going to use is going to be VAR1. Now VAR1 is the one which we just changed in the previous tutorial as well, which was this one, which is now an integer value because the charges are going to be integer values. So that's why we are going to have this variable which we are going to use here. After that, what we are going to do is that we are going to have an on value. Now for the on value, what we are going to do is that we are going to add an on value of one. We're also going to add an off value of uh, one, sorry, not one, but zero. And we are going to specify the font. Now the font which we are going to specify is going to be real. It is going to have a hex of 16 and it is going to be bold. After that, just specify a comma, move here, and we are right here going to specify the command which is going to get executed when you click on this check button. So the command which is going to get executed is going to be named as cab underscore tag. Now this over here is going to be the function which is going to get called upon. So cab tags is going to be the function which we are going to code in the future tutorials. We'll specify the grid for this as well here. Now the grid is going to be row number three, column number zero, and the sticky value for this is going to be a W. Now I guess the reason it is showing me this error is because I guess we have to use this one. And yes, now it is going to solve the problem for me. Now the only error you have got is this because we have not coded this function yet after that what we need to do is that we need to create the text and after that we are going to have the cab text which is going to actually equal to a label which is going to get at the travel frame we are going to specify the font for that which is going to be Arial. it is going to be 14 in size and it is also going to be bold. After that, what we will do is that we are going to use our text variable here that is going to be named as cab text. So let me just show you this variable here at the top. So this is the cab text which we are using now. So this is the variable. Now we are also going to use this one and we are also going to use the travel insurance as well. So let's just move down right here so this is the text variable which we are using the scatter comma enter and after that we are going to specify bd to be six we are going to specify the width here now width is going to be 18 the background for this is going to be white we are going to specify a state for it which is going to be disabled. We are going to have justify as right. And we are also going to specify relief as this value. So this is going to be for the 
text cap text which is actually going to be this zero which you can see right here now the initial value as you can see as well is zero which has been set here inside the constructor here as you can see that the it is set to actually zero so let's just go back so the last thing which we need to do for this first value is that we need to have the text cap text dot grid so in the grid what we are going to do is that we are going to make the row to be three and the column is going to be one and that is going to be it for the first value which we have just here so we will just now do the copying part where we will just copy this paste it and we will just scroll down till here and now what we are going to do is that we are going to do it for the uh, second one which is the let me just show you it is for the distance that is in kilometers so the variable which we are going to use for this is going to check the kilometer which means check the distance it is going to be a check button as well and the text on that is going to be distance and in the brackets we are going to write the m which means that the distance is going to be calculated in kilometers now the variable which we are going to use for this is going to be var2 and the command which is going to get executed when you check this check button it is not going to be cap tax but it is going to be the one which we are going to write in as kilo which means the distance so this is the function which we are going to code the grid is also going to change the grid is going to be row number four column is going to remain the very same for the second part we are going to have the text am as the variable it is going to use the text variable here which is going to equal to k m which is the variable which we are going to use and after that we are going to change just this grid but before that we need to actually change this to k m as well so the grid for this one is going to be row number four column is going to remain the very same so just copy it and let's just code it for the last check button so we will just scroll down till here and what we will do is that we are going to write and check and we are going to write in travel underscore ins so this one is going to be the travel check insurance just copy this just paste it over here not travel insurance but just this one and it is going to be text travel insurance dot right now what we need to do is that we need to make certain changes the text obviously is going to change this is going to be now it is going to be traveling insurance so it is going to be traveling insurance the variable which we are going to use now is going to be the variable number three the command which is going to get executed is also going to get changed and it is going to be named as traveling which is a function which is going to get called upon the grid is going to change where the row is going to actually change which is going to be five column is going to remain the very same now for this part the first thing which we are going to change is going to be this text variable which is now going to equal to the travel endurance the rest is going to remain the same we need to only change this one to five and that is going to do our job so this is the part where we have coded these three check buttons the base charge the distance and the traveling insurance successfully so now we have completed our booking details part in the previous tutorial we talked about the pickup drop and pooling and in this tutorial we covered the three check buttons we have down here the base charge distance and the traveling insurance so the only gui which we are left with is this bottom one where we have got paid text subtotal and we have got the total cost and finally we have got these two buttons the total button 
and I guess the book button. So this is what we are going to code in the next tutorial and that is also going to end the boring part of GUI and we are going to skip to the functions part starting on from the next of next tutorial. So for this tutorial that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we talked about the booking details and in this tutorial, we are going to code the very last thing for the GUI part and we are going to code this payment information where we have got the pay text, the subtotal, the total cost, and we have got these two buttons at the very bottom. So right down here, we're going to add the hashtag and we are going to write in payment info. And in the payment info, what we will do is that the first thing which we need to do, as you can see, is the paid tax. So we are going to actually create a label for it. So we are going to write in self dot label for paid tax. So this is the first thing which we are going to do is that we are going to create a label. Now this is going to get added to the cost frame we created at the very top, which was right here you can see that this was the cost frame which we created so right down here it is going to get added to the cost frame the font for that is going to be Arial it is going to have 14 and it is going to also have bold after that we are going to specify the text so the text on this is going to equal to simple enough. It is going to be paid tax. And after that, we are going to specify certain GUI with it as well, which is going to be the BD is going to be seven. And I guess that is going to be it in the next part. What we will do is that we are actually going to specify a grid to it. So right here, we are going to write in label pay text dot grid. And the grid which we are going to specify is going to have row number zero, column is going to remain one, and we are going to have sticky as W. After that, what we are going to do is that we are going to create a text label so we are going to have self dot txt it text the txt paid text is going to equal to a label which is going to get added to the cost frame the font for that is going to be this very same so we will just copy this from here and we will paste it over here the text variable which we are going to use for it is going to be named as paid text. So this is the uh, label which we are sorry the text variable which we are going to use. We are going to have BDS7. We are going to specify the width to be 10. We are going to have justify as right. We are going to add the background to be white as well. And we are going to have finally the relief which is going to be this one so this is going to be the uh, text paid text and finally we are going to have self dot exp pay text dot grid and this one is going to be row number zero and the column is going to be two for this so now comes the copying part where we will just copy this from here and we will just add it over here. Now, now what we are going to do is that we are going to make certain changes here. The first change is that we need to change the one pay tax with the subtotal. So what we will do for that is that we will just remove this from here and we are going to add subtotal here. We are going to add subtotal here. We are going to add subtotal here as well. And finally, we are also going to add sub 
total here. Now the text here is going to be changed and it is going to equal to subtotal and the grid is going to have certain change. It is going to be row number one and column number one. Then we are also going to change this text variable and the text variable is actually going to change to the subtotal variable we have. The BD, everything else is going to remain the same. All we need to do is that we need to change this one to row number one and column is going to remain two. Then for the last part, we will just copy this. Paste it again and just scroll down till here. And the last one is going to be for the last here, that is the total cost. So we will just change this to total cost. We will change this to total cost. We will change this to txt total cost. And we are going to change this to txt total cost. Now we are going to change this one over here and it is going to be total cost. And we're also going to change the text variable down here, which is going to be total cost. And for the label total cost dot grid, we are going to change this to row number two. The column is going to remain one. And for the second one, the row is going to be two and the column is going to be two as well. Now the rest, I guess, is going to remain the same. We have changed the text, we have changed the text variable, and we have changed the grids. So now comes the part where we are going to code the last part of the GUI, which is these two buttons. So for these two buttons, what we are going to do is that we are going to have self dot and the first button is the total button, so which we are going to create the BT and total, and which, which we are going to create a button which is going to get added to the cost frame. The padding X for this button is going to be 18. We are going to specify the BD to be 3. We are going to specify the font, which is going to be Arial. It is going to have the I guess we just clicked on the insert key. So it is going to be Arial and it is going to have 11 as its thickness and it is also going to be bold. After that, what we are going to do is that we are going to specify width, which is going to be two. We are going to specify the text on the button. So the text on the button is going to simply say Total, we are also going to execute a command which is going to equal to a function which is going to be named as total underscore paid. So, this is the function which is going to get called whenever you click on this button. Moreover, we are also going to change the background for this button, which is going to be the color which you want to choose. So, it is going to be black for me. The foreground color is going to change to uh, white. And finally, we are going to specify the dot grid. And for the dot grid, we are going to have row equal to two. And the column here is going to be three. So, what we will do is that we will just move it down so that it is all visible. So now for the second button, what we are going to do is, which is the, we will just copy this from here and right down here, we are going to paste it. And the second button is going to be the BTN reset. So for the BTN reset, what we are going to do is that it is going to also get added to the cost frame here. What we need to do is that we need to change the text here. So the text on the button is going to be named as book. The command which is going to get executed is also going to change, which is going to actually call upon a function named as reset. When you click on this, we are going to also change the background to yellow. 
the foreground is going to change to black now if you want to change it it is not a must option that you have to actually change it so finally we are going to specify the crate which is going to be row number two and column number four so this basically concludes the gui part where we have got a lot of things you can see that at the top we have got our very top frame that says the taxi booking system then after that we created the frame details where we created the customer name frame which included the customer information the travel frame information where we got the booking details and finally the cost frame which we just coded in this tutorial after that we have got the image part at the very right side of our output window then this was the customer information which used the customer name frame where we have got the first name surname address postcode mobile number and email finally we got the cab information which was the right frame where we got three labels the pickup drop and pooling label for which we created three checkboxes and added values in it then we also got the three checkboxes the uh, cap tax the kilometer distance and the traveling checkboxes and we associated three functions with it as well which we are going to start on with the next tutorial and finally we got the payment information where we got three labels the pay tax subtotal and total cost and we got two buttons the total button and the reset button or you can say the book button so i hope that you have understood the gui part from the next tutorial we are going to finally go to the coding of functions so that is it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cab booking system in python in the previous tutorial, we completed the tick enter part, and in the tick enter part, we got on with some functions which we are going to code. So, if you have a look down here in the tick enter part, you know that we have to code actually five functions here in this travel class. So, if you just scroll down, then you can see that you have got these three functions. For the first check button, which is for the checking of cap tax you have got the cap tax function which you have to code and that is actually for the base charge now if you look at the image here you know that the base charge is actually a check button which we have right here so we have associated this function cap tax with it now there is also one thing you need to know here is that the variable which is associated with base charge or you can say the cap tax function is going to be the var1 variable so we are going to be using this variable for this function that is the cap tax function then for the second check button we have got the kilo function which we are going to call upon and you can see that the variable which is associated with this function is the var2 and finally for the third check button which is associated with the traveling function we have got the variable var3 i guess i just moved up let me just go back right down hill so here it is so you can see right down here that the variable which is associated with the traveling function is the var3 so when i'm coding the first function which i'm going to just start now right down here just before the main frame so right down here i'm going to code the first function which is going to be the cab underscore next function so in this function the we are going to have a globe variable which is going to be item number one and now i just showed you that the variable which is associated with the cap tax is the var1 so what we are going to do is that we have to write in var1 dot get equal equal one which means that if it has got some value only then you are going to do something with it so if it has got a value what we are going to do is that we are going to write in self dot txt cap tax now txt cap tax is what we have written right over here in the base charge so right down here you can see that txt cap tax which is right down here you can see that this is the cap tax which is associated with the travel frame right down here 
this is the cap text which we want to get. So this was the check button and this is the text button where we are going to have something written and if there is something written and the checkbox is checked then what we are going to do is that we are going to have self dot text cap text dot configure and we are going to have a state normal. After that what I'm going to do is that I am going to specify uh, some value into this item number one and what I'm going to do with it is that I'm going to assign it a flow value of 50 which means that 50 is going to get assigned to var1 field and after that what I'm going to do is that I'm going to call upon the set function so for that I'm going to use the cap text here which we have written over here which is set to zero for now now I want to set it to some value so I'm going to write in dot set and what I'm going to set it to is going to be a string value where I'm going to just write in under s since it is going to be in uh, a specific currency so I'm going to just add this and I'm going to add it with concatenate it with the item number one simple enough what I've done here simply is that I have got the cap text configure the state to normal I have inserted a float value into this global variable and after doing that what I've done here is that I have set the cap cap text to this value which I have just used here but I've actually stringified that value now in the else if part what I'm going to do is that what if the var one dot get is uh, not equal to one but var one dot get is let's just say equal equal to zero now this means that the check button we have is not checked so when it is not checked what we are going to do is that we will just copy this from here we are going to paste it over here but this time the state is not going to be normal the state is going to be a disabled state because this means that the check button has not been clicked and for that we are also going to do is that we are going to set the value for the cap text back to zero and also what i'm going to do is that i'm going to specify the value of the global variable here which is the item one to zero so that is going to solve all the text problems for us it is going to specify the cap text which is going to be 50 in this case so i hope that you have understood how we have calculated the cap text here how var1 dot get function helped us to check the state of the button configure the state of the button uh, accordingly and set a specific value of 50 to the cap text using the cap text dot set. So that is it with this tutorial. In the next tutorial, we are going to get on with the second check button that calls upon a function kilo to calculate the distance. So we are going to code that in the next tutorial. For this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we did the first check button and we coded a function named as cap text. So in this tutorial, as I told you, we are going to get on with the second check button and we are going to code this function kilo. Now, before we go on with this, kilo actually means the distance in kilometers. So we are actually calculating the distance in this uh, function right over here so to calculate the distance in kilometers as you can see with the text as well so this means that we are going to be coding the second check button distance kilometers which is associated with var2 so not only we are going to use var2 but you need to understand one more thing over here now when you want to calculate the distance between two points so you also want to know that what are those two points now by two points i means the pickup and the drop location so we are going to go at the top here where we have got the pickup and drop information it is right here so you can see that you have got this label pickup and you have also got this label drop so to calculate the distance you need to actually know that where the customer was picked up and where he was dropped so what you can do is that you can calculate the distance between the two points from where the customer was picked and where he was dropped so 
if you want to know that what you need to also do is that you need to know the location from where he was picked which can be either the arcade lane the fort the cinema or the railway station also you need to know where he was dropped either it was the arcade lane the fort cinema or railway station so let's just say that he was picked up from the arcade lane and let's just say that the drop location was cinema and let's just say that the distance between these two points is let's just say 10 kilometers so to know that you also need to have these two things inside the kilo function now to do that you will also need these two variables varl1 which is associated with the pickup location and varl2 we are also going to need that which is associated with the cb or drop so we are going to be using three variables in this function the first function is going to be the var2 which is associated down there with the check button we have and the other two variables which we are going to use here are the varl1 and varl2 which are associated with the pickup and drop respectively so this was important something important which you need to know before we coded the function so let's just get to the function so right after the cap tax right here is where we are going to code our second function so we will just scroll down so that everything is visible so where is the scroll button here it is so let's just scroll down till here all right so now everything is visible now what we need to do is that we simply write into f kilo this is going to function now the first thing which we need to check is that let's just say that the check button is not checked so we are going to write it in var2 dot get let's just say that it is equal to zero so if it is equal equal to zero that is the end of the story for this function which means that we are going to write in self dot txt kilometer which means that the text field where we have got the kilometers which is this one the second one over here so what we are going to do is that we are going to configure its state so we're going to configure the state to disabled so after that we are also going to write in kilometer dot set we are going to also set it to zero now it is the very same as we did in here where we specified the cap text to be zero if var one dot get was zero. Now km dot set is what we have right here. So we have actually set it to zero if var two dot get is going to equal to zero. Now else if is basically where our entire code for this kilo function is going to go. And we are going to write in else if var two dot get equal equal to one. So that is where the condition is going to be true. Now, we need to also check for two variables and we are going to use the AND operator here which means that all the three conditions should be true. Now the two other variables which we are going to check you know already them those are the varl1 and varl2. So we are going to check if varl1 dot get and we are going to check that they should never be empty so we're going to check if they are not equal to null which means they should not be null if they are null this condition is going to be false and the code inside this else if is not going to get executed and similarly we also need a drop location so for the drop location we have got the varl2 as the text variable so we are going to call upon get function on this as well not equal to zero not zero, but an empty text because it is a string so we want to check it with a string since we have got uh, locations like love boulevard the cinema things like that so those are in text so that's why we are not going to check it with zeros or ones but we are going to check if they are not empty because if we check it with zero then there might be a problem for example let's just say that you select a location which was the default location which is empty in our case where it is it is it's so difficult to scroll down in and look for text so it is right here so let's just say that you selected this so this is also not an option so that's why we are going to check if it is not equal to an empty text and that is what was the default value as well so that's why we are not checking it with ones or zeros so just get in back and after doing that we need to configure the txt kilometer dot configure and we are going to write the state to be normal now what we need to do is that we need to check 
that what are actually the values which were selected for VARL1 and VARL2. Now for VARL1, we can have four values, you know that. We can have all the four locations which we have. And uh, let's just go down. And you can see down here that we have got four locations for our VARL1. The arcade lane, the fort, the cinema, and the railway station. So what we are going to do here is that we are going to write in inside here that we are going to write an if varl1 dot get if it is equal equal to the first location which is the arcade lane then what we need to do is that we need to actually write in a switch statement here and the switch is going to have the distances from arcade lane to all the other locations. Right here, we are going to configure the distance from arcade lane to all the others location. So all the other locations now include the fort. It also include the cinema, but for, uh, before that, we need to actually write in the distance. So let's just say that the distance from arcade lane to the fort is actually 10 kilometers. So we are going to write in 10. After that, we have got a cinema. Now the distance from the arcade lane to cinema is, let's just say eight kilometers. And we are going to have the distance from arcade lane to the railway station. And let's just say that the distance to the railway station is six. And finally, we are going to have the distance from arcade lane to the arcade lane. So we are going to write an arcade lane and the distance to the arcade lane is going to be zero because if you want to travel from arcade lane to arcade lane, it is obvious that the distance is going to be zero. After that, what we need to do is that we need to call upon the set function and we need to set the value for the uh, kilometer here. So for that, we are going to call up the switch, which we have just specified here in which we have specified the distances. So in which we are going to write in varl2 dot get. Now varl2 dot get means that we are actually getting the value of the drop location. So whatever the drop location is, it is going to first get that from in here and it is going to get the value of that. And we did a minor mistake over here. That is that we need to close these in square brackets because we want to actually get the value. So when we specified, uh, specify uh, square brackets, what it is going to do is that it is going to get me the value. So you also need to add a bracket here for the statement here. And we need, and we need, do not need to have this over here. My bad, we need to have it right over here. So now it is going to be perfect. All right. So as you can clearly see that first it is going to get first, first, first it is going to get if the varl one dot get is arcade lane, which means that if the pickup location is arcade lane, then it is going to have a switch statement, which is going to have the distance from arcade lane to the all other locations, the fort, the cinema, the railway station, as well as the arcade lane. So after it gets the arcade lane as varl1 it is going to set the kilometer to the switch statement call upon the switch statement get the varl2 which means the drop up location and set a value from that for example the drop up location was railway station so what this over here is going to do is that it is going to set the km over here to 6 so that's how it is actually done so now we are going to do it for all the other values for the other locations as well, that is if we are well, L1 dot get is let's just say now equal to let's just say it is the second location that is the fort. Now if the location is the fort, we need to again call the switch statement. And in the switch statement, we are going to have all the other locations. So we are going to have the arcade lane. And for the arcade lane, the distance is going to be 10. And as you can clearly see that from arcade lane to the fort, which is right over here, the distance is 10. So it is going to be vice versa. The distance from the fort to arcade lane is also going to be 
10. So we are going to have the distance for the railway station. And to the railway station, the distance from distance is let's just say going to equal to two from the fort to the railway station. We are going to have the distance from the fort to the cinema which is going to be let's say five and we are going to also have from the fort to the fort which is going to be zero so we are going to call upon set we are going to have the switch club here and for the switch call up we are going to have varl2 dot get and that is going to be it it is going to get the value that is going to be in VARL2, that is the drop up location, and it is going to select a value accordingly. Similarly, we are going to have an else if condition for if the VARL1 dot get is not just L, but it is going to be VARL1. So if this is equal to the same, then we need to also have a switch statement for that, which is going to equal to arcade lane. The distance from this arcade lane to the cinema is eight. So from the cinema to arcade lane, it's also going to be eight. And then we are going to have, let's just first do it for the I guess in the order we have down there, let me just see. The order which was right over here is the arcade lane, the fort, the cinema, and the railway station. All right, so we are going to stick with the cinema for the third value. So from the cinema to arcade lane is eight to the fort, we are going to have a distance of five. And for the railway station, we are going to have a distance of three. And finally, we are going to have a distance from the cinema to the cinema, which is going to be zero. So we have got uh, all the distances. What we need to do is that we need to call upon the set here. And we are going to call in this switch, which is going to get us the varl2.get, the uh, value of the, of the draw application, of course. So finally, we are going to do it for the last location. So we are one dot get if it is equal equal to railway station. Then what we need to do is that we need to first enclose it in quotation marks. And right here, we are going to write in switch what is going to equal to arcade lane which is going to have a value of six because you can see from the arcade lane to the railway station is six so it is going to be vice versa and we're going to have all the remaining values here as vice versa values the four is going to be two we are going to have the cinema which is going to have a value of three and finally we are going to have distance from the railway station to the railway station which is going to be zero so that is going to be i guess it all we need to do is that we need to call upon the section for it as well which is going to call upon the switch varl2 dot get and that is going to be it for the distance calculation. So it is going to calculate us the distance which we have here in this function right over here. So it is going to use the three variables. It is going to store the value in the VAR1 and the value is going to be based upon this VARL1, the pickup location and VARL2, the drop location. So I hope that you have understood what we have done here, how we have calculated the distance from a specific pickup location to a specific drop up location. So I guess that is it with this tutorial. In the next tutorial, we are going to get on with this uh, traveling insurance and we are going to code the function we have for it, 
which is, I guess, named as traveling right here. So we are going to code this function in the next tutorial. For this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much, guys, for watching, and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. In the previous tutorial, we coded the check button number two, which was for calculating the distance between two points. And in this tutorial, we are going to code the traveling insurance, which is associated with the third check button. So for the traveling insurance, you know that right here, you can see that we have got the VAR number three, which we are going to have. So for the traveling insurance, we are going to have a specific value which we are going to simply set. So it is going to be a function which is going to look exactly like this. Not exactly, not 100%, but the concept is going to be the very same which we use for the cap tax. So after the kilo function right over here, what we are going to do is that we are going to code the third and last function of our check buttons. So it is going to be named as traveling. And that is exactly where the code is going to go. So in the very same way where we have got the global item which we selected when we were putting the cap tax, we got global item number one. So right here we are going to have a global variable which is going to be named as item three. And what we are going to do is that we are going to use VAR3. So if VAR3.get has some value, which means that if it has got anything, it is going to be one. And what we are going to do is that we are going to simply write in self.txt travel. Insurance dot configure, and we are going to configure the state to normal. After that, what we are going to simply do is that, as I told you, we are going to have a specific defined value, and let's just say we want to set that value to a float value of let's just say 10. That is the choice. You can select the value of your own choice, and after that, we are going to have traveling insurance dot set now dot set is the very same which we have here at the top so we are going to now set the value for this third item that is we have already set these two now we need to set this one that is the traveling insurance dot set so right down here i'm going to set the value and i'm going to just convert it into a string so it is going to be a specific currency that is rs and after that i'm going to concatenate it and I'm going to stringify item number three, which was a float value of 10. So I've stringified it so that it is visible inside that. Now in the else if I'm going to apply the very same concept as of the cap text function, we're going to write in if var3 dot get. If it is equal equal to zero, I'm going to simply configure the state. So I'm going to configure the state for the text uh, travel insurance. And I'm going to configure it to the state, which is going to be disabled. And I'm going to set the traveling insurance. And I'm going to set it to a string value of zero. And I'm going to make the item three here equal to zero. So as you can see, the traveling function and the cap text function are the very same. In the cap text function, we set a specific text of float value 50 and in here we set a specific travel insurance where we set a specific travel insurance of 10 float value we just stringify it in both if the vr 3 dot get equal to zero just set the state disabled traveling insurance dot set is zero and item number three is zero so i hope that you have understood it there was nothing much more new in this but uh, it was a function so we have to code it so I guess that is it. In the next tutorial, what we are going to do is that we are going to code these two functions which are associated with these two buttons. As you can see right down here, these are the two functions we are left with. That is the with the button total, we have got the total paid function and with the button reset, we have got the reset function. So we are going to code the reset function in the next tutorial and after that, the Tutorial after tutorial is going to code the total paid. So stay tuned for that. For this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. And I will see you guys in the next tutorial.
Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. So in this tutorial, we are going to get on with the two buttons we have. So in this tutorial, we are going to code this button that says book. So when I click on book, what I want to do is that I want to book a cap. Also, what I want to do is that I want to reset all these other values. So that's why we are naming this function as reset. So right down here, we are going to code our reset function. You can also name this function as book. Both are valid names for these two functions. So I'm going to have a variable which is going to be named as this, and I'm going to make it equal to ms dot ask yes no. So it is going to be a simple prompt which is going to ask us questions. So the prompt is going to simply say that look right here, but inside here we are going to have prompt. It's going to say, do you want to book? So it's going to simply ask you a question. So if you answer it in yes, so this means that the value of IMS is going to be greater than zero. If it is zero, which means that it is going to simply call upon show info. And it is also going to be a simple message that is going to say, booking successful so it is going to be a simple message that is going to be a success message that is going to say that your booking has been successfully booked and you can also thank your user if you want to it's like thank you for booking or something like this let's just stick with thank you all right so this was the simple uh, reset or you can say the book function so i guess there is not not, not much more of an explanation to do. So the most important function of all is what we are going to cover in the next tutorial where we are going to code this total function. So the total function is associated with the total paid function which we have right down here. So we are going to code this function in the next tutorial. For this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. In this tutorial, we are going to complete our coding part and we are going to code the last function we have in this complete cap booking system that is the total paid function. Now this function is associated with a button I just showed you at the end of the tutorial. So we are going to get the total paid. And in the total paid, the first thing which we are going to get is the type of the journey we are going to have. Now, if you look at the top here, you can see that you have got uh, some types of journey. You have got the standard type of journey. You have got the Ford Galaxy. You have got the Ford Mandu. Now, all these are actually associated with the pooling value because up till now, you might be thinking that why we have got this pooling thing over here for which we have got certain values as well. If you just scroll down, you can see that for the pooling, you have got one, two, three, and four. You have got four values. Now, for the pooling value to be one, it is going to be the journey type where if, if the journey type is one, which means that we are going to do a standard journey. Whereas if you have the journey type equal to two, which means that we are going to have a Ford Galaxy. And if it is, if it is going to be journey, journey type three it is going to be the fourth mandu now for four you have i'm going to leave it up to you we are going to discuss that later so for now let's just stick on with the total paid function so right here what i'm going to do is that i am going to write in that if the journey type dot get is equal equal to one then what i want to do is that i am going to get item two which is going to be a variable which i am going to set to km dot set so you're going to set to the distance after that what i'm going to do is that i'm going to create a very important variable that is going to be named as cost of fair so in the cost of fair variable, what I'm going to do is that now I am going to use the variables which I have here. So the reason I have made it global was because I wanted to use in this total paid function. So we are going to get the traveling insurance from this global item number three. We are going to get the cap tax from this global item number one here. And also 
let me just have one more variable here at the top, which is going to be named as global item number four, and I'm going to make it equal to zero. Since it is at the top, so it is going to be accessible by all functions by default. We don't need that uh, global variable over there. So right down here, the cost of fare is now going to equal item number one, which is actually the cap tax. It is going to get added with a float value, which is going to be item number two, which is actually the distance traveled in kilometers, which is this one. This I need to be in small letters. So now it is going to be good. So it is going to be item number two, it is going to get multiplied with two, and it is going to get added with item number three, which is going to get added with item number four. So basically what is going on over here is that the cost of fare is actually going to equal to item number one plus a float value of item number two multiplied by two. So for example, the distance between arcade lane and the uh, Ford is actually 10 kilometers. So if you are traveling between these two points, the fare for that is going to be 10 multiplied by two. After that, the next thing which we need to do is that we need to calculate the tax. So the tax is going to equal to plus a string value, which is going to have a format, which is going to be this and after that what we are going to do is that we are going to write and percent we are going to have the cost of fair and we are going to multiply the cost of fair with 0 0.09 which is going to be the tax after that we are going to calculate the subtotal so the subtotal is going to be currency which is going to get concatenated with a string value which is going to be percent two f and it is going to be percent and it is going to be the cost of fare after that we are going to have the tax which is going to be so the tax plus the sales tax is going to get equal to the total tax, which is going to be again a string value, which is going to be the percent dot to F and a percent sign hill, which is going to be cost of fear, which is going to get added with the cost of fear multiplied with 0.9. So it is going to get multiplied with 0.9, which is going to be the total paid. So we need to add a plus sign here that solves the problem for us. Now we are going to do what is that we are going to copy this from here and we are going to do it for the other parts where we are going to have now else if conditions where we are going to check if the journey type is two. Now, if the journey type is two, we are also going to have item two equal to kilometer not dot set. So the reason we have it here is that we need to do get not set because we are getting the values, not setting them. So that solves our problem here as well. So the cost of fear for this is now going to be item number two. We are going to have a bracket over here and we are going to also multiply it with 1.5 so if you're doing standard one it is going to be only multiplied with uh multiplied by two but if you are using a ford a galaxy which is a kind of an updated or you can say upgraded type of journey you are trying to have so for that you are also going to get a multiplication of 1.5 so after that, it is going to get added to item number three and item number four as well. So this is going to be the cost of fare in that case. 
The rest for this, it is going to be cost of fare multiplied by 0 0.09. The sales tax is cost of fare. And finally, it is going to get multiplied with 0 0.9. And the rest is going to remain the very same. Now for the last type of journey we have, we are going to just paste it over here. That is, let me just scroll down a bit. So if the journey dot type is three, which means that if you are using a Ford Mindu, so that is going to be the type of journey which is going to be the most expensive. You can say it is going to be the most expensive of all. The only difference is that now it is going to be multiplied two. And that is going to be, I guess, it. Now also we are going to multiply with three so that it is much more expensive if you want to have this kind of a uh, journey. Now what we need to do at the very end is that we need to have the pay tax dot set. We are going to set it to the tax. We are going to have the uh, subtotal. So we are going to have the subtotal dot set and we are going to set it to ST. We are going to have the total cost dot set. And we are going to set it to TD, which is the total cost. So this is the tax here. This is the subtotal. And this is the uh, total cost of your journey. So now here you can see that you've got uh, this problem. Now there might be some compilers which are not going to give you this problem because you can see that we are inside a function. So it, so these are B, these are getting used inside a function, but sometimes they may create a problem. Now there is a solution to that, which is that right inside the function, you can have these variables, the text variable, the total and the total cost variable. So when you initialize these global variables right inside the function here, you can see that now it, this uh, issue has been solved here. So that is the complete code for how you can actually create a cap booking system in Python. In the next tutorial, what we are going to do is that we are going to run this code. You are going to see how the database is going to get created automatically since we are creating a database automatically. So we are going to create the database as well. We are also going to insert data into the database. We are also going to book ourselves a very good looking cap. So stay tuned for the next tutorial. For this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cap booking system in Python. In this tutorial, we are going to finally run our code. But before we do that, you need to make one change. In the previous tutorial, we used the journey type here. So I want you to change that and you, I want you to use varl3.get so that now varl3 is actually uh, associated with this pooling value. So when you write in varl3.get equal equal to one, so it is going to actually get you the kind of journey type. So for one, it is going to be standard. For two, it is going to be the Ford Galaxy. And for three, it is going to be Ford Mando. So for now, I want you to change this so that you can actually extract the pooling value. And according to that, you can actually calculate your fare. So after you have made this change successfully, so you can finally run your code and you can see that you are going to get the login panel, which is going to be the first page, which is going to pop up. You are going to see that it is going to ask you for a username and password. It is going to ask you to log in. And if you don't have an account, it is going to ask you to create an account. And as you can see on the leftmost side, you can see that you have got your users dot database as well. So this database is going to get created automatically as soon as you run your code. So as soon as you click on the run button, the database is going to get created. Now, for now, we don't have anything inside our database, so we cannot log in. For example, you can just write in something like this and you want to log in. You can see that it says username not in the database. So what you're going to do is that first you're going to go into create account and right here, I am going to create an account John123. So after that, I'm going to specify the password to be 123456. And I'm going to click on create account. So you can see that it says that account created successfully. Click on OK. And now you are going to be directed to the login page automatically. Now in the login page, what you can do is that using the credentials you just created an account with, you can just go on and 
you can just log in using those credentials. So you can see that now since your data was in the database, so it did not give you the message of an error that your account does not exist because we have created that account with that credential. So you can see that now you are going to get that. So you can see at the top, you are going to get welcome John123 into the cab booking system. So the first thing which you're going to do is that you're going to enter the customer information. Now for the customer information, let's just say the name is John. Let's just say the surname is Doe. Let's just say that the address is QWER123. And let's just say that the postcode is 123. 134 or doesn't matter and let's just say that this is the phone number and let's just say that ast123 at the rate of gmail.com is the email address so this is let's just say the customer information and now what you are going to do is that you are going to select the pickup so let's just say that i want to get picked up from the arcade lane and let's just say that i want to get dropped at the cinema so after that you are going to select the pooling and let's just say that i want to go with the Ford Galaxy. So I'm going to click this base charge. Now, if you don't want to, let's just say, apply a base charge on a specific customer, you can just exclude that. So I want to apply the base charge as well as the distance, as well as the traveling insurance on the customer. So you can see that when I clicked on these, all these are going to get pop up. Now, you can see that the distance from arcade lane to the cinema is eight. So that's why you have got this eight over here. So if I want to change it, let's just say that I want to now go to the railway station. So I'm going to uncheck this and check it again. And what, and this is now going to get changed to six, which is the distance between arcade lane and railway station. Now you know that the base charge is going to be fixed, which is going to be 50. We set it to a float value of 50 and stringify that. And we also set the traveling insurance to 10. So it is also going to stay 10. Now what you need to do is that you need to just click on this total button and what it is going to do is that based on the three values that were the tax, the ST and the TT values which we set it, it is going to display the values according to those formulas. So it is going to get the paid tax. So the tax which you have to pay is going to be 7.02. The subtotal is going to be 78.00 and the total cost which you have to pay is going to be 148.20. So the reason you are going to pay so much is because you are using the pooling to be 2. If you select the pooling to be 1 and now click it, you can see that the charge is going to get minimized because now you are having a standard journey. Whereas if you select 3 and click on total, you are going to see that the charge is going to increase much more because now you are having a third type of journey on the Ford Mandu. So what you need to simply do after that is click on book and you can see that it is going to ask you that do you want to really book this? Click on yes and you can see that it says booking successful. Thank you so much for using our service. So that's how your system works. This is how the cab booking system is going to go on. I hope that you have understood each and everything we have covered in this. So in the next tutorial, I'm going to give you three to four challenges and let's just see if you can do it or not. So for this tutorial, that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to another tutorial where we are learning how to create a cab booking system in Python. So in the previous tutorial, we were able to run our code and it ran successfully. It created a database for us, created entries into that database, allowed us to create an account, inserted that data into the database. We logged in using those credentials and we actually booked us a cab as well. Now there are a few challenges which I want to give you because there is a reason that learning and listening is not the complete learning. Listening is only 10% of the learning you do. The 90% learning is what you practice yourself. So that is exactly what I'm going to give you here. So I want to give you certain challenges here. So you can see that if you just scroll down here, so you can see that you have got this over here, journey type where we have not selected anything. So let's just exclude it, let's just not get into it. So now what you can do here is that I want you to do something with this luggage. You can see that we have got this variable over here that was item number four, which was equal to zero. We did not uh, select it, any value for it, but 
when we calculated the tax over here as well, you can see that we added item number four to it. Now this item number four, as I told you that I'm going to tell you later when I give you a challenging task, that is exactly that task. What I want you to do is that I want you to create a function which is going to ask you if you want to add luggage. So this was the output screen. What I want you to do is that I also want you to have a, let's just say a button, which is going to ask you if you are having luggage or not. So if you enter yes, it is also going to ask you the weight of that luggage. And I want to, and what I want you to do is that I want you to have something like this over here, what I'm, and it is going to be in item number four. And in item number four, what I want you to do is that I want you to take in the weight and multiply it with some number and then that number is going to get added up right over here. That is going to be in item number four. So if you are a customer and you are also having a lot of, let's just say luggage with you, then the cab is going to charge you for that luggage as well. So that is exactly what I want you to do. And you, I want you to take it as a challenge and add this in the cost, which is, so it is not only going to help you sharpen your tech enter skills, it is also going to help you do this part that is the backend kind of thing. So I hope that you have understood what I want you to do. So that is it with this section. Thank you so much guys for watching. Hey guys, what's up? I welcome you to the very first tutorial here on this game where we are going to cover the Flappy game in Pi game. Now in the previous tutorial, you have already covered the introduction part and you know that what we are going to be doing from this tutorial on. So before we go on into the coding part, I need to show you some folders which I have already got here. So as you can see that I have created a project that is going to be named as Flappy Birds game and in that I have got various folders. Now this is the virtual environment folder that is the common folder which was also in the previous uh, games as well. And this is the folder unit you know, that is going to be created automatically when you create a project. So you don't have to go into it. Now inside this Flappy Birds game project you can see that I have created a file that is known as flappy.py and that is where we are going to be doing our coding part. Now you can see two extra folders right over here. The first one is the images folder and the second one is the sounds folder. Now if you extend the images folder you can see that you have got various images. You have got 0.png and starting on from there 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8, 9.png. Then you have also got the background.png, you have got base.png, you have got bgf.png the bird.png, message.png and pipe.png. So if I just open one of these, you can see in the 4.png you have got this 4 over here. Then if you open the background.png, then this is basically going to be the background where we, uh, when we play the game, this image is going to act as the background of the game. Then we have got base.png and this is going to be the base which means the bottom part of the playing area then you have got the bgf.png which is going to serve as the background image then we have got bird.png this is going to be the bird which we are going to control then in the message.png you have got the message that says get ready and finally you have got pipe.png in which you have got pipe which is going to serve as an obstacle for the build which we are going to dodge and achieve scores. So I hope that you have understood how we are going to be using these images and we are going to use all of these images and if you have and if you have covered the introduction part you know that all of these images are basically going to be required in this game. Then we have got one more folder that is named as sounds and if we extend this folder you can see that you have got die.wav, hit.wav, point.wav, swoosh.wav and wing.wav. So these are the sounds which we are also going to require. The die.wav is going to just play when the bird die, when it hits something it is going to Play hit.wav when you score a point, which means that if your score is incremented, the point.wav is going to run swoosh.wav and wing.wav similarly. So we are also going to require these five sounds as well as well as all these images. So I hope that you have understood why we have gotten these folders and 
in the at the end I'm also going to attach these folders for you so that whoever of you might want to make this game or remake it you can just go on and copy these images and download them from the link down so I'm going to upload these images as well as these sounds for you so that you don't have to look for them somewhere else so coming back to the coding part what we are going to do first is that we are going to import modules so the first module we are going to import is going to be the random module now it is going to help us generate random numbers then we are going to have the sys and what we will be doing with this module is that we will use the system.exit to exit the program then comes the most important of all that is import by game and we are also going to have the basic pygame import so that's why for that we are going to write in from pygame dot locals we are going to write in import steric now after doing the import part what we are going to do is that we are going to define the global variables for the game so the first global variable is going to be the fps that is going to be the frame per second then the second variable is going to be the screen width which is going to equal to 289 then we are going to have the screen height and that is going to equal to 511 and the reason I am using the screen width to be such a specific number that is 289 and screen height to be such a specific number that is 511 is because the images I have used right over here that is the background.png as well as this background image.png these images are in this format I have when I downloaded these images I opened them in paints and I resize them according to this that is 289 by 511 and I hope that you know how to resize images in paints or any other you can use any other software to resize images according to these dimensions I have provided over here that is the width is going to equal to 289 and the height is going to equal to 511 that is going to be the playing screen width and playing screen height respectively after that what we are going to do is that we are going to create our window so for that we are going to write in window equal to pygame dot display dot set mode and we are going to write in the mode to be the screen width and the screen height so this is going to help us create our playing window which we have done using the pygame.display.set mode after that what we are going to do is that we are going to define our play area so for that we are going to define a variable that is going to be named as play area and play area is going to equal to the screen height steric 0.8 now obviously this is going to reduce the height because the width is going to remain the same but we are going to reduce the playing area height now the reason behind this is that we are also going to encapsulate the base.png because as you can see that this is the background image but we are not going to play on this complete part because at this very end we are going to have this base.png as well so that's why we have to reduce the screen height so to reduce the screen height we have multiplied it by 0 0.8 which means that we are going to be playing on the 80 percent part and the 20 percent is going to be the base and when the bird touches the base it is going to be game over simply after that what we are going to do is that we are going to have an array that is going to be the game image and it is going to have all the images for us you are going to see how it is going to be used similarly we are going to have the game audio sound and that is going to be again an array and you're going to see how it is going to get used basically the game image is going to have all these images and the game sounds is going to have all these sounds so that's why these are arrays over here after that we are going to define our player so the player is basically going to equal to 
the images folder and from the images folder it is going to be background dot png so as you can see in the images folder you have got background dot png and this is going to be the player over here sorry it is not it is going to be the background image it is going to be let's just have it player equal to images slash bird dot png my bad it is not going to be player it is going to be the background image so we are going to write in background underscore image and that is going to be images slash background dot png which is right over here whereas the player which i have specified to be images slash bird dot png it is going to be there so this is going to be the player and this is going to be the background image which we have specified right over here similarly we have to also define the obstacle over here so for that we are going to define a variable that is going to be named as the pipe image which is going to serve as the obstacle and it is going to be images slash pipe dot png and it is going to take into account this image that is the image for pipe dot png which is going to serve as an obstacle so these were the global variables which we are going to be using in this Flappy Bird game. So what we have done so far in this tutorial is that I've shown you these two folders, the images folder which are which is containing the images which we are going to need and the sounds directory which is holding the five audios which we are going to be needed as well as we imported the required modules as well as we defined all the global variables and we also got the player which is the bird.png we got the background image that is the background.png and we got the pipe image that is the pipe.png so in the next tutorial what we are going to do is that we are going to have the code regulation part which means that we are going to control we are going to define the main of this code so main is basically going to be the area from where the entire code is going to be controlled so in the next tutorial we are going to be doing that so for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this flappy bird game in pi game so in the previous tutorial we have imported the required modules as well as we have defined the global variables for this game now as i told you in the previous tutorial that in this tutorial we are going to code the main part so here we go we are going to write in if name equal equal to main so this is going to be the regular tree part where we are going to regulate the flow of code so we will just scroll down a bit and right from here we are going to start doing the main part so we are going to first initialize the pi game after that we are going to use the time clock so for that we are going to define a variable named as time clock and we are going to write in pi game it is not going to be minus it is going to be equal to pi game dot time dot clock after that what we are going to do is that we are going to have the display dot set caption and we are going to set the caption to flappy bird game simple enough what we are doing we are going to name it according to that now the next part is where we are going to have our images loaded into the arrays which we have created right over here so in the game image we are going to use all these images and in the game audio sound array we are going to be using all these sounds which we have defined right over here so we are going to actually name the elements in the array so for the numbers part which you can see right over here the numbers we have got from 0 to 9 what we are going to do with that we will just scroll down a bit and we are going to write in the game image and in the game image we are going to name it as numbers so the numbers is going to equal to right here we are going to write in pygame dot 
image dot load and what we are going to load is basically going to be images slash zero dot png and after that what we are going to do with it is we are going to call in the function that is the convert alpha function onto it so we are going to load all these images one by one so we will not waste our time on it so we will just copy this from here this is for one two three four five dot png six dot png seven dot png eight dot png and nine dot png and all we will do is that we are going to just change the numbers over here that is 2.png it is going to be 3.png it is going to be 4.png it is going to be 5.png it is going to be 6.png it is going to be 7.png it is going to be 8.png and finally it is going to be 9.png and we don't need this comma over here now so what it is going to do is that it is going to load the images which we have specified over here so for the first case it is going to load 0.png and it is going to convert it into alpha which means that it is going to convert it into a alpha numeric number so in here it is not an alphabet as you can see it is basically a numeric letter so that's why it is going to convert it into a numeric character and it is going to help us display the score so that was for the game image numbers part where we have loaded the images from 0 to 1 after that we are also going to take into account the other images that is the message the base and the pipe so for that what we are going to do is that we are going to go right over here and we are going to write in game image and this time it is going to be named as message and message is going to be named as image dot load and it is going to be images slash message dot png dot convert alpha similarly we are going to have game image we are going to do it for the base and that is going to equal to pygame dot image dot load and we are going to load images slash base dot png dot convert alpha similarly we are going to do it for the pipe so it is going to be game image pipe and that is going to equal to pygame dot image dot load from the images we are going to load pipe dot png dot convert alpha so it is going to help us load the images and one more thing we are going to do with this pipe part is that because we want the pipes to be of random sizes we don't want every pipe to be of the same size because if you have played the flappy bird game or if you have covered the introduction tutorial you might have noticed that the pipe in the lower and from the the hanging pipes as well as the pipes that are on the ground they are of different sizes and that what makes this game interesting so for that what we will do is that we will not do it according to this what we will else do is that we are going to use the transform function over here so we are going to write in game dot transform dot rotate and we are going to load now pi game dot image dot load and we are going to load the pipe dot png sorry the pipe image we are going to load the pipe image and after that we are going to call in convert alpha 
and we are going to specify comma 180 which means that it is going to be from 0 to 180 and after that what we will do is that we are going to write in pygame.image.load pipe image dot convert alpha so this is what it's basically going to help us to not only rotate the pipes by rotation i means that since the as you can see the pipe image over here you can see that it starts from the bottom and go up to the top but if you have played the flappy bird you know that pipes also hangs from the top which means that this is going to be the upper side and this side is going to be the lower side so for that we need to rotate the image so that's why we are going to have pygame.transform.rotate and what we are going to rotate is basically going to be the pipe image and this is basically the pipe image which we have already loaded using the images slash pipe.png so what it is going to do is that it is going to load pipe.image it is going to rotate it and convert it into alpha this is going to help it vary the size and finally it is going to load the resized and the transformed image so this was for the first array which we have initialized right at the top here that was the game image array in which we have caught some parts the first part contains the numbers the second part contains the message the third part contains the pace and the last part contain the obstacle that is the pipes so I hope that you have understood how we are going to use the game image array. So for this tutorial that is it in the next tutorial what we are going to do is that we are going to take into account the second array that is the game audio sound array and in the next tutorial we are going to deal with this folder that is the sound folder and we are going to load these five audios into this array that is the game audio sound array. So for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up I welcome you to another tutorial on this Flappy Bird game in Pygame and in the previous tutorial we have coded the game image array and we have done some changes to it. Now in this tutorial we are going to first go on with the game audio sound as well as we are going to also load these two images which we have not actually loaded in the previous tutorial that is the player and the background images into the game image array. So first we are going to deal with the game audio sound. So we are going to start on with that game audio sound and the first part of it is going to be according to this that is the die. So we are going to name it as die and this time we are going to write in pygame.mixer.sound and what it is going to sound is basically something that is in the sounds folder that is die.waw similarly for the second one it is going to be hit so we are going to have game audio sound it is going to be hit that is going to play that is pygame.mixer.sound and what it is going to play is going to be from the sounds folder that is the hit.waw after that we are going to have the game audio sound for the point it's going to be in single quotation mark not sound it is going to be point and that is going to be pygame dot mixer dot sound and from the sounds folder it is going to have point dot waw then we are going to have the game audio sound swoosh and it is going to be pygame dot mixer dot sound and it is going to be sounds slash swoosh.waw and finally the wing.waw so for that we are going to have again the game audio sound wing is going to be its name and it is going to be pygame dot 
mixer dot sound sounds slash wing dot w a v so this is basically going to be the array for the game sounds in which we have got five voices the die dot w a v the hit dot w a v point dot w a v the swoosh dot w a v and finally the wing dot w a v and as i told you that we are also going to load the images that were the background image and the play player image so for that we are going to use the game image and that is going to be named as background and it is going to be by game dot image dot load and we are going to load the background image which we have at the top and we are going to call in the convert function onto it and after that finally we are going to have the game image for the player and that is going to be pi game dot image dot load and it is going to load player dot convert alpha and that is going to be it the last thing we are going to do is that we are going to have the while loop over here so right here we are going to write in while true what it is going to do is that it is going to call a function that is going to be named as welcome main screen and what this function is going to do is that it is going to show the welcome screen to the user until he press a button and finally we are going to call in the game main function so for that we are going to write in main gameplay so these are the two functions which we will be coding so we are going to code it from the next tutorial what we have done so far let me just give you a quick recap of that we have imported the required modules we have got our global variables then we have got our controlling part of the game where we have initialized the game image array as well as the game audio sound array and in the game image array we have got numbers message base pipe background and player whereas in the game audio sound we have got die hit point swoosh and wing whereas also we have got the while loop that is going to call in two functions that is the welcome main screen and the main gameplay function so we are going to code the welcome main screen function in the next tutorial so for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on this flappy bird game in pi game and in this tutorial we are going to code the welcome main screen function which we have called right down from here in the while loop in the main function so right down here after defining the global images we are going to define the first function of our game that is the welcome main screen now in the welcome main screen what we are going to be doing is that we are going to show the welcome images on the screen now to show the welcome images on the screen what we have also to do is that we have to specify first the coordinates where these images are going to appear on the screen and after that we are going to use the blit function to actually display these images now we are going to be displaying various things the first one is the player then we are going to di display the message and then we are going to display the base image so for the player we are going to define the x and y coordinate using the p underscore x and the p underscore y similarly for the message we are going to have the x coordinate using message x and y coordinate using message y and for the base we are going to simply have b underscore x and that is going to be for the base we don't want any kind of y for that because base image is going to occupy the entire length of the y coordinate so that's why we don't need it so px as i told you is going to be the x coordinate of the player so where we want it to appear is basically going to be the screen width divided by five so divide the screen width by five convert it into an integer if it is a float number and that is going to be the x coordinate where the player is going to appear as soon as the game starts that is the welcome screen 
after that we are going to define the y coordinate and that is going to be the screen height minus the game image so we are going to subtract the player from it and after that we are going to get the height of the game image dot player and we are going to subtract it from the screen height divided by 2 and that is going to be the y coordinate of the player location as soon as the game start so what i mean here is that it is going to have the game image player so there we have got the where it is where it is that is the player so this is it is going to get the height of this it is going to subtract it from the screen height divided by 2 and that is going to be the y coordinate of the player after that we are going to have the message x which means the where the message is going to appear so this is the message.png so where we want it to appear we are going to define the x and y coordinate for that so for the x coordinate it is going to be the screen width minus the game image that is the message dot get width divided by 2 and that is going to be the x coordinate of the message dot png after that we are going to define the y coordinate as well so it is going to be int screen height steric 0.13 and it is going to be the message y coordinate and similarly it is going to be zero which means that it is going to appear at the very bottom that is the base image so these are basically going to be the images which we are going to require after that what we are going to do is that we are going to define the gaming loop inside this main welcome main screen function and we are going to write in for event in pygame dot event dot get what we are going to do is it is not going to be it is going to be for event in pygame dot event dot get what we are going to write in that is if the user clicks on the cross button or close the game so we are going to write in if event dot type equal equal to quit or the event dot type equal equal to key down and event dot key equal equal to key underscore escape then what it is going to do is that it is going to have pygame dot quit and system dot exit so right here what we are saying is that if the event dot type equal equal to quit or the or if you have a key down event and the key down event is that of an escape key then it is going to actually close the game after here what we are going to do is that we are going to define an else if condition as well and in the else if we are going to write in that if the event dot type is a key down event and the event dot key is either equal to the space key or if it is the event dot key equal equal to the key up then that is basically where you want to actually play so if you click on the escape key it is going to actually quit the game or if you click on the space key or the up key then it is going to actually start on the game for you so that's why right here we are going to write in return and in the else condition right here we are going to write in not like here like here we are going to write in window dot blit game underscore image 
and we are going to have background over here and we are going to specify the location that is going to be zero zero then we are going to have window dot blit game underscore image the player and we are going to define the coordinates for that and we have already specified the coordinate for that to be px and py so we are going to use them right over here that is px py and we are going to just have it right over here and it is going to be window dot blit game image and it is going to be message and the message is going to be at the msg x and the msg y that is the x and y coordinate for the message and we are going to finally have window.blit for the base so it is going to be window.blit game image and it is going to be base and for the base it is going to be the b underscore x and the y coordinate for this is basically going to be the play area which we have specified in the global variables right over here that says the screen height steric 0.8 so that is where the base image is going to pop up because it is going to be on the entire play area and this is going to be the x image that is going to equal to 0 from here after that we are going to write in pygame dot display dot update and we are going to write in time underscore clock dot tick according to the fps and that is going to conclude the first function of this game that is the welcome main screen function so i hope that you have understood what we have done right over here the first thing we have is here that we have defined the x and y coordinate for the player the message as well as the base then we have defined a simple gaming loop in which we have written that if you click on the escape key it is going to quit the game whereas if you click on the key space or key up it is going to return and in the else condition what we have written over here is that we have blitted the four images that is the background the player the message and the base image and finally we have called it by game .display .update. that is going to help us run the game and we have got time dot tick according to the frame per second so i hope that you have understood what we have did in this tutorial in the next tutorial we are going to code the most important function of this game that is the main gameplay function and main gameplay function is basically the area from where the entire game is going to be controlled so for this tutorial i guess that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys i welcome you to another tutorial on flappy bird in pi game now in the previous tutorial we coded this function which is visible right in front of you that was the welcome main screen function. So before we go on to the main part of this game that is the main gameplay function let me just try and run this code and see what happens. But before we run this code we have to comment this out because we have not coded this function and this is going to be an error for now. So let's just uh, run this code and see what happens. So you can see that you have got this screen that says Flappy Bird Game and you have got an uh, image that says that is the uh, welcome image that says get ready and you can see that you have got the background, you have got the base but for now you cannot uh, play this game because you have not coded the main gameplay function. So this was what we have done so far. So let's just remove this comment from here. And let's just move right down after this welcome function and right down here is basically where we are going to code the most important function of this game that is the main gameplay function. Now inside the main gameplay function we are going to do a lot of things. 
the first thing we are going to do is that we are going to have a variable in which we are going to initialize the score to be zero because as soon as the game start the score of the player is going to be zero after that what we are going to do is that we are going to specify the x and y coordinates for the player so these are going to be initialized using this px and the py variables so we will just move down a bit so that everything is visible to us in this main gameplay function so right here we are going to give it a value we are going to convert it into integer and that is going to be the screen width divided by 5 that is going to be the x coordinate for the player and screen width divided by 2 is going to be the y coordinate for the player after that we are going to have the base x that is going to equal to 0 now after defining these coordinates what we are going to do is that we are going to deal with the obstacles and by obstacle I mean the pipe now if you have played the tic-tac-toe game you know that for the x coordinate the position of the pipe is somewhat same for example if one pipe appears right uh, let's say over here then after let's just say after 100 indexes the second pipe is going to appear right here and the starting position of every pipe at the top is same whereas if you talk about the lower pipes right down here the position of the pipes in the lower end is also the same what changes is basically the y coordinate so right here we are going to define a variable that is going to be n pipe 1 that is going to equal to a function which we are going to code later that is going to be get random pipes and similarly we are going to define one more variable that is going to be n pipe 2 that is going to again call the very same function that is get random pipes now the reason we are going to call this function two times is because the n pipe one variable is going to be for the up pipes which means with the one that are going to hang from the top and then n pipe two is going to be for the pipes that are the low pipes which are going to be from the ground to the top so that's why we need to call this function two times now this over here is basically going to give us a value for the y coordinate specifically because as i told you the for the up pipes and for the low pipes the x coordinate is basically going to be same only its position is going to increment to a specific number for example if one pipe is here after 100 indexes we are going to have a pipe here then again after 100 indexes we are going to have a pipe here whereas the y coordinate is going to change because let's just say one pipe is going to be up till here the second one is going to be up till here the third one is going to be up till here fourth one is going to be very small up till here so that's why the y coordinate is going to keep changing but the x coordinate is going to remain the same only a specific increment is going to be added to the x coordinate so right down here what we are going to do now is that we are going to have a variable that is going to be a kind of a dictionary that is going to be up pipes up pipes now the up pipes variable is basically going to equal to we are going to have the x coordinate and the x is basically going to equal to the screen width plus 200 whereas if you talk about the y coordinate it is going to be the value which is going to be generated from this n pipe one so we are going to write in n underscore pipe one zero y coordinate similarly we are going to have a comma here and we are going to define x to be screen width plus 200 plus the screen width divided by 2 and for the y it is going to be the n pipe 
two, zero and y. Similarly, we are going to do the very same for the low pipes. So we are going to have one more a dictionary that is going to be the low pips. And that is going to equal to the x is going to be the screen width plus 200 whereas the y is going to be the n pipe 1 And here we are going to have x screen width plus 200 plus the screen width divided by 2. The y is going to be the n pipe. 2, 1, y. Now it may seem a bit confusing to some of the uh, listeners here. Now the reason is because we have not coded the get random pipes function which is basically getting us the y coordinate. The x coordinate is quite quite clear that it is going to be screen width plus 200 screen width plus 200. But I will explain explain this uh, y coordinate when we code this get random pipe function. So for now you don't have to worry about what's going on over here just forget about it. Just remember that it is going to give you the pipes from the top, it is going to give you the pipes from the bottom and these are going to be random pipes of random sizes. Alright, so after that what we are going to do is that we are going to have a variable that is going to be PIPVX that stand for the pipe vertical velocity and that is going to equal to minus 4. After that we are going to have a PVX variable and that is going to determine the downward speed of our player. So that is going to equal to minus 9 because when you flap the bird it just go at the top and then comes to the bottom. So the speed at which it is going to move towards the ground in the downward direction that is going to be determined using this PVX that determine the player velocity in the X coordinate. After that we are going to have PMVX that is going to equal to 10 then we are going to have the player move velocity towards the y coordinate that is going to equal to minus 8. Now because uh, as you know if you keep flapping the bird it is not only going to go in the upward direction or the downward direction but it is also going to move in the forward direction. So the speed at which it is going to move in the forward direction is going to be 10 and the speed at which it is going to move in the downward direction is basically going to equal to minus 8. We are also going to determine the accuracy of our player. So for that we are going to have P accuracy and that is going to equal to 1. And we are also going to have the flap accuracy that is going to determine the speed at which the bird is going to move in the upward direction. So for that we are going to have the flap accuracy. And the flap accuracy is going to equal to minus 8. The P flap is going to equal to false. After that what we are going to do is that we are going to have a while loop. So we are going to have while true. We are going to have a kind of a gaming loop here that is going to say for event in by game dot event dot get what we are going to do is that we are going to write an if event dot type equal equal to quit or the event dot type is a key down event 
and the key down event is actually that of a key escape then what that is going to do is it is going to simply exit the game for you so you are going to write in pygame dot quit and system dot exit whereas if the event dot type equal equal to a key down event and the event dot key equal equal to either the key space or the event dot key equal equal to key up then what it is going to do is that it is going to start the game for you so in that case we are going to check if the p y coordinate is greater than zero then what we will do is that we are going to make the p v x equal to the p flap accuracy and we are going to make the p flap equal to true because if you click on the key space or key up key it is going to start the game for you so when the game is started we don't want this p flap to be false because we want the player to flap then so that's why we are not only going to make the p v x equal to the p flap accuracy that is minus eight but we are also going to make the p flap equal to true which means that the bird can now flap whereas also we are going to use the game audio sound so we will write in game audio sound and what we want to play is basically the wing sound so right here we are going to write in wing and we are going to call in the function that is play which is going to play the uh, function because whenever you click on the key space or key up it is going to play this wing sound for you that is you are going to see what this sound is it sounds like someone is actually controlling the uh, player so I hope that you have understood what we have coded up till now now I think that is it uh, that it's enough for a single tutorial we are going to continue on with this function from the next tutorial but let me give you a quick recap of what we have did in this tutorial so we started on from here we had a variable score zero then we defined the initial px and py coordinates for our player that was the screen width by 5 and screen width by 2 that are the x and y coordinate respectively. Then we called on uh, the function get random pipes which we have not coded up till now and we store the result of those two functions in npip1 and npip2. After that we are going to have the up pipes and the low pipes the up pipes and low pipes they are going to have the same as uh, x coordinate whereas the y coordinate is going to depend on this value which is going to be returned from this function get random pipes and as i told you don't need to worry about that we are going to explain that in detail when we code this function so let's just skip this part after that we are going to have the pip vx minus 4 we are going to have the pvx that is the velocity of the player in the downward direction that is the velocity of the player in the forward direction that is in the downward direction this is the accuracy then this is the flap accuracy of the player and for the initial the p flap is going to equal to false then comes the gaming loop in which we write in if the event dot type is a key down event that is a key escape then it is going to quit the game whereas if the key down event is either a key space or a key up it is going to start the game and to start the game it is going to check if the py is greater than zero if it is greater than zero then it is going to have the pvx equal to p flap accuracy and the p flap is going to equal to true and it is going to play this swing sound for you so that is it with this tutorial in the next tutorial we are going to check for collisions and we are going to call in a function is colliding Whereas we are also going to complete this uh, function that is the main gameplay function. So for this tutorial that is it. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up I welcome you to another tutorial on Flappy Bird in Pygame. And in the previous tutorial we have coded on till this and in this tutorial we are going to continue on from here and we are going 
to complete this function. So right down here, what we are going to do is that we are going to have a variable that is going to be the CR test that is for the collision test. And in that collision test, we are going to call in a function that is going to be named as is colliding, which we are going to code later. And to check if the player is colliding, we need to check if it is colliding with the upper or lower walls or with the up pipes or low pipe. So that's why to this function, we are going to pass in some coordinates. The first one is going to be the X. That is the X coordinate of the player. Then we are going to pass in the Y coordinate of the player because this function is going to check in the X and Y coordinate of the player. And accordingly, it is going to decide if the player has collided or not. Not only we are going to provide the X and Y coordinate of the player, we are also going to provide in the up pipes and the low pipes. And accordingly, it is going to decide if the player has collided with the upper wall, the lower wall or the up pipes or the low pipes. If any of this collision has occurred, this thing over here is going to receive true, which we are going to check right here. That is if CR underscore test so if it returns true we are going to call in return over here so that is for the collision check we are going to code this function later as well so now what we are going to do is that we are going to have the middle position of the player and accordingly we are going to check for the pipes as well so we are going to have a variable that is going to be for middle positions we are going to write in px plus game image of the player dot get width divided by 2 so when we divide the game player image and we get the width of it and divide it by two and add it to the px coordinate we are going to get the middle position of where the player is at a certain time so now after this what we are going to do is we are going to write in for pipe in up pips what we are going to do is that we are going to determine the middle position for the pipe. So we are going to write in pip middle positions equal to the pipe x coordinate plus the game image of the pipe. We are going to get the width of that. So that is going to be game image for pipe zero dot get width divided by two. And that is going to get us the middle position of the pipe. And after that, what we are going to do is that we are going to write in for pip middle positions. That is if the pip middle position is less than or equal to the p middle positions and is less than the pip middle positions plus four then what we are going to do is that we are going to increment the score now this means that if the player has passed the middle position of the pipe what I'm seeing over here is that this variable over here, that is the P middle position that stands for the player middle position, which is going to be obtained using the game image player dot get width by two and adding the X coordinate of it because we also want to know the position of the player at that time. So what we are going to do is that we are going to write in for pipe in up pips. We are going to get the middle position of the pipes as well. And after we have got the middle positions of the pipe, we are going to check if the pipe middle position is less than or equal to the player middle position. And that is less than the pip middle positions plus four. This means that the player middle position has passed through the middle position of the pipe. And when it occurs, what we are going to do is that simply we are going to increment the score by 
one and we are also going to write in a print statement so that in the console we can see what's going on so we are going to write in your score is and we are going to have score printed right over here in these curly brackets and we are going to have the game audio sound for the point played because since the score is incremented which means that the player has secured a point so that's why we want to play the sound of point and this game audio sound point dot play is going to do that job for us after that what we are going to do is that right here we are going to have an if condition and in here we are going to check if the p v x is less than the p m v x and a not p flap then we are going to have p v x plus equal to the p accuracy now what does that mean if if you have a look at the top here p v x is actually equal to minus 9 whereas p m v x is equal to 10 now clearly as you can see over here that p m v x is greater than the p v x and then it says uh, a not of p flap then p v x is going to get incremented by the p accuracy and by p accuracy you can see that it is actually one which means that it is going to get incremented by one and when it get incremented by one which means that the downward speed of the bird is going to increase which means that the game is going to get harder with time and that is exactly what is going on over here after that we are going to write an if p flap then p flap is going to equal to false right here we are going to write in the p height that is going to be obtained using the game image of the player dot get height so it is going to get us the height of the player and we are going to write in the py is going to equal to the py plus the minimum of pvx play area minus py minus p underscore height so the it is going to be underscore y all right now it is good so it says that the it is going to first obtain the p height that is the height of the player which is going to be obtained using the p height uh, game player player dot get height and after that we are going to change the y coordinate and how it is going to change the y coordinate it is going to add the current y coordinate to this value which we have specified over here that is the minimum of p v x play area minus p y minus p hat so whatever is the minimum of these two values it is going to obtain that and that is going to be the value of the new p y after that what we are going to do is that we are going to have for p i p underscore upper and pip underscore lower and zip we are going to have the up pipes we are going to have the low pipes and we are going to have pip upper plus equal to the pip underscore vx and similarly we are going to have the pip lower x plus equal to pip vx now what the statement over here means is that the up pipes and low pipes x coordinate is actually going to change now if you have a look over here where we specified the x and y coordinate for the pipe that was the screen width plus 200 
which means that after every 200 it is going to have a pipe now what we are adding into the pip upper x is the pip vx and if you have a look at the top over here pip vx is equal to minus 4 which means that it is going to be plus 200 in, in the start and later it is going to be 196 then it decremented by 4 again decremented by 4 again which means that as soon as the game proceeds the pipes are going to get closer and closer and closer to make the game more and more and more difficult for the player to play so that's why what it is going to do is that the up pipes and low pipes distance for the x coordinate is going to keep decreasing so that the game level becomes harder and harder with time after that what we are going to do is that we are going to write in if zero is less than the up pips zero x is less than five then what we are going to do is that we are going to introduce new pipes into the system so to introduce new pipes into the system what we are going to write a new pipe equal to and we are going to call in the function that is the get underscore a random pipes that is for generating pipes because as soon as the if, if zero is greater than the up pip zero x and that is less than five which means that the game is proceeding for time then what we want is that we want to introduce new pipes into the system so introducing new pipe into the system is going to need the get random pipes function and we are going to introduce up pipes and low pipes as well so that's why we are going to write an up pipes dot append new pipe zero and we are going to implement low pips dot pend new pip one after that what we are going to do is that we are going to write in that if the up pipes zero x is less than the negative of game image of pipe dot get width then we are going to have up pips dot pop zero and low pips dot pop zero now this means that if the up pips 0x is less than the minus game image pipe 0 dot get width which means that it is going to get the width of the pipe negative of it and if it is the up pip 0x then what it is going to do is that it is going to pop out pipes from the system which we have appended right over here. So after that comes the part where we are going to use the window dot blit method. So right here we are going to write in window dot blit the game image that is the background and we are going to have it at zero zero then we are going to write in for pip upper the pip lower in zip up pipes and low pipes we are going to simply write in window dot let the game image for pipe zero the pipe underscore upper x and the pipe upper 
Y. So that is going to blit the game image for the upper pipes for me. Similarly, we are going to write in window dot blit the game image. Or the pipes, so let's just remove this from here. The pipe and this time it is going to be for one. And this is going to be for the PIP lower. X. And the PIP lower. Y. So that is going to give me the lower pipes and this is going to help me blit the images onto the window that are the upper pipes and these are for the lower pipes. After that we are going to write in window dot blit the game image for the base and that is going to be as the previous one that was the base x comma the y coordinate is going to be the play area after that we are going to blit the player so we are going to have window dot blit the game image for the player and that is going to be at the p underscore x and the p underscore Bye. Now the last thing we are going to blit over here is basically going to be the score but for that we need to first uh, do some uh, things over here we are going to write in d equal to int x for x in a list of the string to score w is going to equal to 0 and we are going to write in for digit in d what we are going to do is that we are going to have w plus equal to the game image for the numbers because we want to add up numbers that is going to be the digit dot get width and we are going to have the x offset for that and that is going to be the screen width minus w by 2 that is going to be an equal to sign and after that what we are going to do is that we are going to write in four digit in d we are going to write in window dot blit the game image for the numbers that is actually going to be the digit and we want to be it to be at the x offset that is going to be the x coordinate and the screen height steric 0.12 is going to be the y coordinate it is not going to be plus it is going to be multiplied by 0 0.12 and we are going to write in the x offset plus equal to the game image for numbers digit dot get wet so not only this is going to uh, help us get the numbers for us let uh, the numbers for us but also it is going to keep incrementing the score for us it is going to keep incrementing and it is going to give us the result and the last thing we are going to do in this function is the pi game dot display dot update and time dot sorry the time clock dot tick according to the frame per seconds so that is it with this uh, function so let me give you a quick recap of what we have done in this tutorial and then we are going to move towards the next tutorial where we are going to code the is colliding function 
so I guess we started on from here the first thing we did over here was to check the collision testing and for that we called in the is colliding function and we passed in four parameters to it the first one was the x coordinate of the player the y coordinate of the player the up pipes and the low pipes and if this return true we are going to just return so we are going to code this function in the very next tutorial where you are going to see how it is going to help us generate a result that is if a collision has occurred or not then what we are going to do is that we need to have a variable to just calculate our score and that is going to be incremented only if the player middle position has passed the pipe middle position and if it is it is going to increment the score by one it is going to display the score right down here in the console and it is going to play the point audio for you as well after that what it is going to do is that it is going to increase the player speed as well and it is going to just generate the height for that it is going to change the y coordinate of the player accordingly then we are going to have uh, the pipes distance decremented we are going to add more pipes we are going to pop up pipes and then comes the blade part where we blade it every image and finally comes the part where we just got the score for us that was done using this part so i hope that you have understood what we have covered in this function this was the core of this complete game as well the whole game is going to be uh, running using this function that is the main gameplay function so for now we have got four errors as you can see here at the top and these four errors are basically the four functions calling one is right here one is right here and two are right here so this means everything is working fine till now only we have got these four calling functions which we are going to resolve soon in the next tutorial we are going to code the is colliding function that is going to receive in the four parameters so for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on flappy bird and pi game and in this tutorial we are going to be coding the is colliding function and the is colliding function as you know is going to receive in four parameters the px py and the up pipes and the low pipes so as you can see in the game that basically the collision can occur only in three areas the first one is if the player collides with the play area or try to move outside of it may it be the top side or may it be the down side the second type of collision can occur with the up pipes and the third type of collision can occur with the low pipe so we are going to code all of these three in a sequence so first we are going to check for the player y coordinate because the x coordinate is going to keep moving for let's just say that this is the play area now the player is going to keep bumping like that now it cannot collide with this part or this part because it is going to be continuously moving all it can collide is with either this top or this bottom or the pipes so if you talk that if it is good to collide with the upper playing area or the lower play area then we are actually talking about the y coordinate not the x coordinate because it is it can no there is no way that it can collide with the x coordinate so that's why we are going to check if the player y is greater than the play area because we don't want it to move outside of the play area minus 2 5 or if the py is less than zero which means that it has collided with the downward surface so this was if it has collided with the upper surface and this is if it has collided with the downward surface so if any of these conditions is true which means that the player has collided what we are going to do is that we are going to go into the game audio sound we are going to play the hit sound and call in the play function with it and simply return true so if it returns true right over here where we were actually calling this 
function which was somewhere over here I think yes here it is so right here it is going to generate error it is going to generate true and it is going to return right from here so I think we have to change this over here to is underscore colliding yes it is and you can see that the errors numbers has been reduced to three now what we are going to do is that we are going to do the checks for the up pipes and low pipes so now the pipes are not single in number because the up screen and low screen is single in number but for that we need to use the for loop so for the pipe in up pipes underscore over here for pipe and up pipes what we are going to do is that we are going to have the pip h that is going to get us the height of the pipe so we are going to write in game not game audio sound but game image for the pipe and since we are talking about the up pipe so we are going to have zero dot get height so it is going to get us the height of the pipes and after getting the height of the pipes what we are going to do is that we are going to write in if the p y coordinate is less than the p i p h plus the pipe y and the absolute value of p underscore x minus the pipe x is less than the game image for pipe 0 dot get width which means that a collision has occurred then what it is going to do is that it is going to simply call in game audio sound hit dot play and this function is going to return true so this was if the collision occurs with the up pipes as you can see here the first thing we did here is that we obtained the height of the pipes now after obtaining the height of the pipes what we are going to do is that we are going to check if the y coordinate of the player is less than basically the height of the pipes plus the pipe y coordinate now let's just suppose that the up pipe let's just say extend up till here and the py is somewhere right over here so if this py is less than the p height which means that it can possibly not pass through it which means that the collision has occurred similarly for the second condition if the px minus the pipe x is less than the game image of pipe dot get width which means that again the which means that the player has passed through the pipe but it has collided with the inner side of the pipe which means that again the collision has occurred which means that it is going to have this game audio sound hit dot play so after that we are going to have for pipe in low pipes we are going to write in if the p underscore y plus the game image for the player dot get height is greater than the pipe y and the abs of p underscore x minus pipe x of the game image for pipe 
zero dot get width then again it is going to play that game audio sound for a hit dot play and it is going to return true and i think we've got some error over here let's just move it to the same line and absolute of game image is going to be less than and we don't need it over here just remove it from here and right down here just remove it from here and let's just code it again so it is going to be game underscore audio so right down here we are going to have game audio sound hit dot play and right down here we are going to return true which means that the collision has occurred with the lower pipes so that is it with this function so this was for the collision with the upper or lower area this was for the collision with the upper pipes and this was for the collision with the lower pipes so i hope that you have understood what we have covered right over here in the next tutorial what we are going to do is that we are going to code the last function that is going to be the get random pipes function and one more thing i think we need to do over here is that if nothing happens what it is going to do is that for example if it enters none of these statements then it is also going to return false as well and that is going to conclude this function is colliding for us in the next tutorial we are going to code the last function of this uh, complete game that is the get random pipes function so for this tutorial that is it thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up i welcome you to another tutorial on flappy bird game in pygame now in this tutorial we are going to code the last function of this game that is the get random pipes so we are going to write in get random pipes over here now what this function is going to do is that it is going to generate positions of two pipes one of these is going to be bottom straight and one is going to be top rotated and both of these are going to be both both of these two pipes are going to be for blitting on the screen so the first thing we are going to do over here is that we are going to get the horizontal position of the pipe image which we have got in the images folder so we are going to write in piph equal to the game image of the pipe dot get height so what that is going to do is that it is going to get me the height of the pipe. Now after getting the height of the pipe what I want to do is that I want to have a variable of s that is basically going to give me the surface area of the pipe that is going to be the screen height by 3. After that what we are going to do is that we are going to have the upper pipes as well as the lower pipes. So for the lower pipes, we are going to have a variable yes2 that is for the y coordinate of the lower pipe. Now to generate the y coordinate of the lower pipe, we are going to have of s plus random dot random range, and it is going to be from zero to 
the screen height minus the game image for the base dot get height minus 1.2 steric d of s so this is going to give me the y coordinate of the lower pipes then we are going to get the x coordinate of both the pipes so for that we are going to have a pipe x variable and the x coordinate is going to be very same that is going to be the screen width plus 10 after that we are going to have a variable y1 that is going to give me the upper pipe y coordinate so the upper pipe y coordinate is going to equal to the height of the pipe minus the y e s2 which we have calculated plus d of s after that we are going to create the pipe and as i told you that this function basically is going to generate position of two pipes one bottom straight and one top rotated for splitting on the screen and right here we are going to specify the coordinates of two pipes so for the first pipe that is the upper pipe we are going to specify the x coordinate for that that is going to be simply the pipe x whereas the y is going to equal to minus y of 1 since it is the upper pipe after that we are going to generate the second pipe that is the lower pipe so for the lower pipe it is going to be a straight pipe so that's why we are going to write an x equal to pipe x whereas the y is going to equal to the yes to and after that what we are going to do right here is we are going to return this pipe over here and that is going to do our job so right here you can see in this function is the first thing we have is that we have obtained the height of the pipe from the image after that we have calculated a of s variable that is the screen height divided by 3 then in the yes to that is basically as you can see the y coordinate of the lower pipe because this is the lower pipe and this is the upper pipe so this was just two over here is basically the y coordinate of the lower pipe and that is going to equal to the of s that is screen height divided by three plus a number from a random range that is from zero to this variable and what is this variable it is going to get the game image base subtracted from the screen height and subtract it from 1.2 steric of s so that is going to generate a pipe of a random size and it is going to be acting as the y coordinate of the lower pipe then for the upper pipe we've got this y1 variable that is the piph minus yes2 plus of s now you must be thinking that why the lower pipe sorry the upper pipe right over here is not a random number it is again going to be a random number because right here in the y1 we are subtracting y yes2 from here and yes2 is going to be a random number because of this statement right over here that is random not random range over here so that's why again y1 is going to be a random number that is going to generate me a pipe of a random size that is going to be the upper pipe so we are going to have a random upper pipe and a lower pipe and these two position of the two pipes are going to be sent for blitting on the screen so that is it with the code so before i re-explain this code let me just run this code and let's just hope that it works so let's just run this code and yes we have got our screen so let's just click on the upper arrow key and you can see that your game has start running and you can see that you have got pipes of random sizes from the upward and downward direction your bird is moving you can hear the audios as soon as a point is scored the sound of the flap you can hear everything you can see that you've got pipes and you can see that now you hit now you heard the hit sound as well and you can see that the game has now paused over here 
because now it is waiting for an instruction from us. If we click on the escape key, it is going to exit and if we click on the upper key again, it is going to restart the game for us. Right down, you can see the base as well. You can see it is again a game over and right in the center of the upper screen, you can see that you have also got the score. That is going to keep incrementing as soon as you pass the center of the pipe as you can notice over here it is going to increment the score for you and you can see that if you collide on the downward screen it is going to be game over if you collide on the upper side it is going to be game over if you collide with a lower pipe not like that if you collide with a lower pipe it is going to be a game over and if you collide with an upper pipe it is again going to be a game over as you can see so if you click on the escape key it is going to simply close the game for you so I just hope that it was interesting for you. You can simply go on and code this game. You can play this game and in your lifetime you might have played this game before but now you are able to code this game yourself in Pygame right here in PyCharm. So I hope that you have understood every concept we have covered right over here. One more thing we need to understand over here is I, when I told you that I'm going to explain it later. So as you can see that this is basically going to be returned to wherever this function is called from which is right at the top somewhere over here. Right here. So right here what it is going to do is that it is going to have the x coordinate to be the screen width plus 200 whereas the y which was actually equal to the y coordinate which was equal to minus y1 in case of the upper pipe and sorry the lower pipe and in case of upper pipe it was the minus y1 and in the case of lower pipe it was the yes2 so this is exactly what is going to be received in this npip1 and npip2 over here and right now i hope that you can now understand what is going to be the values right at the top here so let me just uh, give you a quick recap of what we have done and then we are going to exit on with this game so at the top we have got our four modules random system pygame and we have got pygame.locals then we have got our fps we have got the screen width and height this is going to have the screen for us this is going to have the play area for us and we have got two arrays the game image and the game audio sound which we have used very conveniently in this game then we have got our player we have got our background image we have got our pipes then comes the main part right down here where we are initializing the game image array and the game audio sound array simply and we are also calling the welcome main screen function right from here so in the welcome main screen function we have not done much we have simply got our images splitted the background image the player image the message image and the base image the main function lies right here that is the main gameplay function where we are doing a lot of things we are creating our pipes assigning them positions we are having the velocities of the player set we are having our flapping we are checking the collisions we are having the score incremented we are checking if the we are in we are either incrementing or appending pipes or we are either popping up pipes and we are also decreasing the sizes between the, the closeness between the pipes as well and finally we are blitting the pipes and finally we are blitting the score right over here then in the is colliding function we checked in for three statement that is if the collision occur at the top or bottom or if the collision occur with the up pipes or the lower pipes and then i've shown you when i played the game i made the game over at every instant i made the bird collide at the top i made the bird collide at the bottom i made the bird collide with the upper pipes and i made the bird collide with the lower pipes and in every case you might have noticed that the game was over and that is where the is collision function is going to come into account and it is going to pass in true to where we are calling it and it is going to check if cr test it is going to simply return then comes the last function where we are creating our two pipes and we are going to pass it to where these pipes are creating. So it is going to pass in the position of those two pipes for blitting on the screen and in the main play we have got those 
related as well that is the main game flip function and this is where we are actually blitting our pipes so that these are going to be blitted according to the positions which we have passed in from here so i hope that you have understood what we have covered in this game it was a very interesting game that was the flappy bird game so i hope that you have understood every concept and you are ready to code it now yourself so for me that is it thank you so much guys for watching bye bye